Welcome to Mic Drop, the podcast where relevancy is irrelevant and we don't give a shit about your feelings. Ladies and gentlemen, as always, it's both an honor and a pleasure to bring to you my next guest for the podcast. He spent just under nine years as a U.S. Navy SEAL. He did three combat deployments, two to Iraq and one to Afghanistan. He is a SEAL qualified sniper as well as a JTAC, which for those of you that don't know, that's calling in air support or being able to bomb the shit out of your enemies while you're on the ground staring at them. He has a BA in pure math. And yes, that's pure math from Columbia University. Uh, He is currently just starting into the NASA program and is a recent hire. He enjoys long walks talking about astrophysics. And he is the star of the new Nintendo game, Super Mario NASA Edition. Please welcome to the podcast, ladies and gentlemen, uh, a gentleman and a scholar, Mario Romero. Brother, what an introduction. (laughs) I appreciate it. Um, You have some powerhouse guests here, and uh, it's really an honor to uh, to have been asked to be a guest. Well, I'll tell you, it's it's my pleasure. I I like to bring... um, you know, good, good quality guests on. And, uh, you're certainly no exception to that. So I, I appreciate the, you know, the, the humble, um, approach, but, uh, I mean, to me, the, some of the things that you've done are, are pretty fucking amazing and, and certainly things that I, I'm confident that I couldn't accomplish. Uh, obviously we'll get into a lot of the ins and outs of it, but, um, thank you for being here. I know you're busy with, uh, you know, in, in the pipeline to become a fucking astronaut. So, uh, we'll, like I said, we'll talk about that, but, uh, one thing I, I do like to ask uh, everybody is, is everybody's kind of into into the routine of, of some of the things I like to ask everybody, but I like to throw a couple of curveballs in there. But uh, to me, I, I, I've got to know for you, what is your morning routine? My morning routine. So I guess I guess it would be situation dependent on what what uh, that next morning consists of. Yeah, uh, I haven't been in school or working for the past few months, so. It has not been so you're as disciplined. Up at noon with red panties around you. Yes, neck. sir. <laughs> <laughs> um, I uh, I generally love to sleep. Yeah, I'm not a I'm not a four thirty four a.m. Yeah. Yeah. workout kind of guy. Amen. I uh, I'd like my six to eight hours of sleep. Yeah, but uh, generally I start off a little slow. I I have my morning coffee. You know, I I check my mail, uh, e- emails, my social media. I. Um, play with my dogs that's i gotta give them the morning belly rubs yeah take them outside what kind of dogs do you have i have two toy australian shepherds toy australian yes very small that's cool what uh have you had them for for a while uh about two years for one and the the youngest one i just had for maybe 10 months now so you had them in new york when you were yes no shit yep that had to be a fucking nightmare and they're actually perfect for new york and fortunately i lived right next to a park in new york city so i was able to take them out every day um and they're just small enough that i can yeah you know they can manipulate their way and and actually run around yep yeah that's good shit sorry i didn't mean to derail your uh your morning routine but so you you play with the dogs and then uh do you have like a kind of a system in terms of nutrition or um, you know, things that you eat or don't eat or anything like that? No, right now I'm actually like free falling in terms of diet just because <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm getting ready to move. I've been traveling all across the country. Um, but, uh, I have done like the physique competition type meal prep yeah. before. Um, yeah. I've been, last time I did that was maybe January. Yeah. Uh, I will be getting back into it pretty soon. I like to, you know, a few months out of the year, I like to incentivize myself by getting on these like really strict programs yeah and uh that way i just kind of keep on that fit side yeah. at least partially yeah I, I or i should say at least i don't move too far away from being fit yeah. throughout yeah. the year you know it's, it's interesting you say that one of the things I, I think is a good analogy to to reference uh working out eating right and, and these are things that we talk about on the podcast with a lot of guests because most of them are pretty active and, and have that kind of background but i kind of view it like the stock market you know is that working out is it's not a uh a straight path of going you know from point a to point b that's that's at a at a curve or an angle up like there's there's peaks and valleys and and to me that's that's part of life a and b i think that's what makes things interesting and c i think that there's an element of um of efficacy that's involved where your where your body is you know never really kind of in that rut or or gets too ingrained in a plateau by doing that. I think it is important to take a couple of weeks or even a couple of months and 
not necessarily eat like shit, but you know, kind of not worry about anything that that in that way. Like just enjoy life and 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 blow off training. I mean, to me, one of the most uh, strangely but simply profound statements is everything in moderation, including moderation. Like sometimes you need to binge on fucking pizza and sleeping in or, or having a good time, taking a vacation, whatever, and, and, and not worry about keeping everything so fucking structured to where, uh, you know, you essentially have no, no purpose in life. I think, uh, I think a balance that way is, is a must, but, um, one thing I, I guess you mentioned the, um, you know, kind of competition meal prep type thing, you know, for that was, did you actually do like bodybuilding or physique competitions or, or you're, you're saying that, uh, just the, the meal prep was, was in line with, with how strict that is. So recently it's only, um, pertaining to in line with it, but mm. back in like 2015, I had every intention to, uh, to compete. Yeah. Um, I was on this six month program. It just so happens that in the competition was, the end of August and I had just gotten accepted to Columbia university. So I had to be at Columbia, but the competition was in San Diego. Yeah. So I never actually got to step on the stage. Yeah. But, uh, after having done months of that kind of meal prep, I kind of got the hang of how to do it, what yeah. to eat, what not to eat. Yeah. In terms of kind of the, the basic synopsis of, um, of what that was like, did you lean more towards paleo keto balanced zone? I mean, what can you kind of give us a quick uh, rundown as to what sure. that was like? I'm not, I'm not super familiar with keto, so I don't, know the ins and outs of that but it's, uh, it's basically like super high fat moderate protein and almost no carbohydrates it's it's similar then yeah. yes okay. it's it's sort of similar um also similar to to the paleo kind of um however it's it's really just a pain because it's you're eating all day for me i, I was trying to gain weight yeah. so and one of the hardest things for me to do is gain weight, yeah. uh, gain good weight. I'm right there with you. And so I, I had to start eating at 5 a.m. And then I wouldn't be done eating till almost midnight. Yeah. And it was just like a part time job fucking yeah. fuel in your body. No, I know it. Well, I mean, when you're training hard, it really is that way. I know for me, the and I went over this in one of my fitness podcasts. I won't, won't beat the dead horse too hard. But to me, the, just like with everything, I, mean, I talk about balance and dog training. I mean, to me, balance is, is the key component to life is there, there's got to be balance with everything. Yin, yin without the yang isn't yin, essentially. And, and uh, you know, I think from a, from a nutrition standpoint, uh, when it's coupled with performance, at least for me, is that if I starve the glycogen out of my liver and, and muscle tissue, like I suffer in the gym and I've, I've gone months, you know, cause people are like, Oh, it's the keto flu. And now you'll get through it. You know, you got to break that, that barrier or whatever. Like I never broke that fucking barrier. I was angry. You know, I lost a lot of good weight. I wasn't any leaner. Uh, I lost, you know, about eight to 10 pounds of fucking good, solid muscle tissue and, and a lot of strength and, and muscular endurance in the gym. And I was fucking angry, you know? And, uh, so I, I adopted, you know, a kind of a modified hybrid of, doing a little bit of carb load at night uh, as per Ben Greenfield's advice on one of the Rogan podcasts. But, um, that's worked out tremendously for me is that I, I eat, you know, keto basically all day and fast for 12 to 14 hours at night and in the morning and then eat nothing but, you know, liquid and, and high fat in the morning, uh, all up until late afternoon, have a, a high protein meal and then a high carb meal at night and that's it. But that's worked out really, really well for me. I mean, you don't see veins in my fucking stomach, but, uh, but it's a good, good mix of kind of everything for me. But um, do you have a favorite food? I love eggs. Eggs? I oh, do. <laughs> I love like sunny side up eggs with yeah. like toast and butter. I mean. So is, is that your cheat meal then? Is is a fucking eggs on toast with butter? I guess. I mean, yeah. that is just. It's a kind of a boring cheat meal. Really? Yeah. I don't know. I don't I, I just, I love it. Ever since I was a little kid. It's, yeah. Fucking eggs on toast. Huh? All right. Um, simplicity. Yeah. No, it's good shit. Um, most embarrassing moment my most embarrassing moment. Wow. Um, so I can say when I was in third phase in buds, we were doing a, uh, we were doing a, we were on the line at La Posta shooting and, uh, you know, because you can have embarrassing moments, but then you have embarrassing moments in front of other team guys. It's just amplified a hundred mm -hmm. times fold. Um, but I remember standing on, on the line, we were doing pistol drills and, um, they went ahead and called load and make ready. And I had popped off around <laughs> a fucking AD. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, it was pointed down range. It was yeah. like a negligent discharge. Yeah. And I knew 
instantaneously like what I did. And I looked around real slowly and everyone had pulled their pistols back. <laughs> You're the one like, asshole. At the yeah. So for a yeah. brief moment, yeah. they nicknamed me load and make bang <laughs> instead. The only saving grace, yeah. however, was about two iterations after another guy did the same exact thing. So what, obviously what were you guys shooting? Pistol, pistol. We were, yeah. We were just shooting the SIG and uh, you know, Anything that you do, like I said, yeah. in front of team guys is just... No, it's amplified a million yeah. times. I know it is. And especially when it's, A, when it's something serious like, you know, weapons training, but B, um, you know, when it's when it's kind of a direct reflection of competency or incompetency or, or will be viewed as such, even when it's not. I mean, I mean, I know so many really good dudes that have had some some pretty gnarly ADs, honestly. I mean, some that were bordering on like you know, they could have gotten their fucking trident pulled and, and shit can for it. Uh, but I mean, it's just, I mean, that's the reality. The, it's the nature of the beast. I mean, it's like getting bitten dog training or burn as a firefighter. Like when you're pushing the envelope weapons training, like things happen, you know, you can only mitigate that so, so, so much, but yeah, I know that that shit is embarrassing. It makes you feel like a, the turd in the punch bowl, right? Fortunately, it never happened again. Yeah, I learned my lesson good. that time. Yeah, that'll give you give you some amazing trigger finger discipline uh, and and muzzle awareness for sure when when something like that happens. But um, I, I'm always curious uh, in terms of you know whether it's seals or or you know people in any field that uh, that's kind of you know f- from the public's viewpoint an, an elite. Uh, area what uh, what was the most powerful influence for you growing up um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be military related just kind of generally speaking like to, you know to look back at your childhood and from the time you can first remember until as we sit here uh, is there is there one kind of fundamental element that that's influenced you the the most I think uh, to answer that honestly would be movies I've always been inspired by movies. Oh, shit. I can trace wanting to be a seal, wanting to be a team guy back to predator. Yeah. You know, I can yeah. trace my love of astronomy and, the, and the cosmos to, you remember that eighties movie flight of the navigator? Yeah. Little kid. Yeah. That time dilation that occurs in that, that yeah. I was, I was, you know, astonished. Yeah. I needed to un- understand what it was. Star yeah. Trek, yeah. these kind of movies, these things always have been like pinnacles of, of, of where I am today. Yeah. These are tipping points that led to, Mm-hmm. Yeah. How how old are you? I'm 35. Yeah, so I mean, you know, we're not that that far difference in age. I mean, one of the things that I, it's interesting you say that because the, I, I mean, obviously everybody thinks there's elements of their childhood that were the best of of all time and whatever. But I I really do think the 80s, like growing up in the 80s with with TV and movies, fucking Miami Vice, Knight Rider, Street Hawk, Airwolf, fucking A Team, like. For for guys at least, you know, um, is that there was an element of of fucking badassery that existed that just d- it doesn't exist today, you know, where uh, where you know guys kicked ass and fucking took names and and you know there, there's there's an element I think or or a, a a consistency with with guys you know that that right now are anywhere from you know early to mid thirties to to fifty you know, that, that grew up watching a lot of that shit that, uh, that, ha- that did play a huge role in it. I mean, because there was, there, there was still an element of like that, that true American hero, like, you know, the essence of GI Joe or whatever. And, and, uh, you know, I'm sure there's a bunch of assholes out there that would, uh, you know, coin it, uh, toxic masculinity and all this other shit, you know, which I disagree with. I, I think biologically there's an element of, uh, you know, just in human nature that there's, there's things that, that, that women are a certain way about. There's things that men are a certain way about, and I, I don't think you should fight it. Um, obviously like with anything, there can be overblown examples of each of those. There can be people that are, that are too, too high on one end of the spectrum on both of them. But, uh, I think that that's a huge element that's missing. And it's, it's interesting to hear you say that because I, um, I find that that's largely missing. I mean, like kids today don't, don't watch TV really anymore. Like they watch YouTube and, and fucking Netflix and whatever, but the, the content is very, very different nowadays. What, uh, what's your take on that? I, I agree. I think what you're pointing out is uh, an essential element of each of those tales in the eighties, where is that they contain the hero's journey, mm-hmm. the, the person coming in, you know, witnessing this monolith of challenge in, in front of them. And then they have, you know, developing relationships and, and overcoming through grit and determination, yeah. getting over this monolith. And today, yeah. you know, I don't see that. Yeah. You just said it yourself. I don't see that much played out in, yeah. in movies. I'm, 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 it could be that I'm not paying as much attention, yeah. but 
I, I see it as missing. Yeah, no, I do too. I mean, I think uh, like a show like MacGyver is another good example. Like, oh, yeah. you know, just the, the man's man, like can fix anything, which I mean, I could take a page out of his book. I'm not the handiest fuck around. I'll, I'll be the first to admit, but, uh, but just, you know, shows like that, I, I think, uh, yeah, they're hugely missing. One thing, one show that I, that I think, uh, that I always really liked or two, two of them actually was Knight Rider, oh, yeah. uh, and, and Miami Vice actually, I don't know if that was maybe a little before your time, but Don Johnson. Uh, yeah. But I mean, to me, like, and, and even Airwolf, um, you know, the, that helicopter, uh, show there, what I liked about those is that there was an element of, um, they didn't always fucking win. You know, like there were times where, uh, especially with Miami Vice, like it was kind of a flip of a coin as to whether or not the episode ended. You know, like you didn't always know, oh, they'll, they'll figure it out. They'll pull it off like with A-Team or, or whatever. And there were some elements with Knight Rider that way too. But I think as dumb as it may sound, like I think that's an important element that uh, you, you can't give people too, you know, too much confidence or inspire them to the point where they think it's always going to end up fucking roses. Yeah. But uh, anyway, we could talk about '80s movies all day long, but uh, but Predator, Predator's essentially the reason why you why you joined the Navy, huh? Yes, sir. Yeah. That movie. In fact, um, I remember being I remember being really young, um, and I've spoken about this before. Asking my brother because I was infatuated. I had it on VHS tape, and I I would just watch it over and over and over. And I asked my brother, "What are these guys?" And I he said, "I don't know. I think he, my brother's only about three years older than me, so he was also a child." Yeah. He's like, "I don't know. I think they're seals." And I said, well, what did SEALs do? And he said, um, well, they blow stuff up on the beach, I think. <laughs> and I said, well, that sounds terrible. I'm going to be a Marine. You know, yeah. the Marines sound like boots on the ground. But then, yeah. obviously, as I got older and started reading and understanding more about what SEALs did, I was like, okay, so, yeah, it is. Yeah. Even though they were Green Berets, I think, in the movie, they yeah. were SF or something. Yeah. It still drew me to that, like, tactical in the field. Yeah. And uh, I can trace it. I can trace the, the long line in that cosmic web in my head to uh to that prior cause being yeah uh predator yeah which led me to want to go to buds oh, that's some funny shit did did you uh did you read any like the marcinko books or um or or the movies or anything like that uh in seal specific ones like navy seals or or uh, any of that, or the rock or anything like that or, i watched yeah i watched the rock i never read any of the marcinko books i read uh the chuck Ferrer book yeah. and i think as I was about to go in, I read like the Warrior Elite 228. Yeah. I read that front to back about 12 times. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I wanted to limit all surprises at Bud's so that I could yeah. have like, you know, the easiest. Yeah. yeah. I say that in quotes, you know, yeah. the easiest time going through. Yeah. Um, but I read those. I read like uh, any kind of magazine that I got my hands on that was any SEAL specific or any documentary on, on uh, Discovery Channel. Yeah. I was all over. I'm, I'm curious. I mean, I know how it was for me because I did kind of a similar thing. I read a lot and, and you know, movies and, and whatever. But uh, what was your interpretation of Buds compared to what you thought it was going to be? Was there a huge disparity or was it like were you caught with your pants down? Or were you like, yeah. Oh. So, you know, like I said, I, I read and I tried to watch as much so I can limit those surprises when I get there. I would know what to expect. But you know, we, we have this fantasy factory in our minds and in that fantasy factory, when we're in buds, we're, we're hearing the Metallica in the background, we're yeah. hearing the theme music and it yeah. all, it's cool and there's glory and everything, but then you show up, there's no music, yeah. you're cold, you get wet, you realize this actually kind of sucks. <laughs> you know, yeah. this is not what I was thinking, but yeah. like, Hey, this is what it is. Yeah. It's not, this wasn't in the fucking brochure. <laughs> yeah. I, I found myself saying that. I don't know how many fucking times, but uh, last curveball question. When was the last time you shit yourself in public? Ooh. Um, shit myself in public. It could be a shart. That's fine. <laughs> that's a good question. Uh, maybe in buds. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, while in the chow line. I think, I think yeah. everybody shits yeah. themselves yeah. in buds. Yeah. Um, I cannot recall anything. Yeah. That's good. You got, you got better control over your bowels than I do, apparently. For now. Yeah, I mean, as now. I age. Yeah, give it a few years. <laughs> Wait till you hit 40. No, um, no that's good shit. Um, you know, what I what I also, you know, just with your background being what it is, uh, you know, SEAL team-wise and whatever, I always like to get, get and delve into uh, just a little bit of the, you know, childhood and upbringing and things like that. Where, where did you grow up? And, and if you could kind of talk about... Uh, the family dynamic in, in your childhood a little bit. Sure. I grew up in Vineland, New Jersey. It's like this, it's actually a large city in New Jersey, largest city square mileage wise, but um, it's not the richest 
um, location. My family, I grew up with my mother, uh, brother and sister, Mm -hmm. and we were section eight housing kids. Uh, we were obviously on on welfare and it wasn't, uh, though we weren't you know, the most financially stable. I I'll still tell you to this day, I had a great childhood. You know, I, I didn't know any better. I didn't know. I wasn't aware of my, you know, economic circumstance. Yeah. Um, so I made do with what I had, you know, we were, we were fortunate in the eighties. We were the outside kids. We were the dirty, go out and play, yeah. come back, you know, when it starts getting dark. Mm-hmm. Um, so we were able to get our hands dirty. Um, and then probably around age nine or 10, my, my mother married and, uh, we, we actually got to move up social, you know, improve our station in life slightly. Um, but I grew up actually a Jehovah's witness. So get the fuck out. Yeah. So (laughs) it was, it was a a super restricted lifestyle. We weren't allowed to celebrate. I was wondering when you knocked on the door, I was like, is that fucking Jehovah's witness out there? They would be, if you had Jehovah's (laughs) witnesses out here, I would be super impressed. Uh, They've been out here actually a few times. Yeah. They're fucking You got to listen to them at that point. Well, what I do is I actually, if I see them coming, like, cause you can see them coming. I get, (coughs) excuse me. I actually get naked, <laughs> completely naked. I swing the door all the way open and just put my hands on my hips. I'm like, hey, fucking come on in, have a seat. And, Do they and, come in? And they, uh, <laughs> they've not come in yet. So uh, usually they don't usually, usually don't stick around too long. Wow. That's a good tactic. Yeah, I'm fucking with you. But uh, yeah. uh, that, that's some wild shit. Uh, tell, tell me about Jehovah's Witness. Yeah, so, you know, I have a tendency to extract or attempt to extract the good out of every situation. And though... Jehovah's Witnesses is a super restricting. I, I felt like I wasn't allowed to have friends. People were considered worldly people. I was uh, uh, I was only to consider them associates. Um, but although I had all these different restrictions placed on me, I I I value a lot a few things that I you know still retain from the Jehovah's Witnesses, and that is we weren't born to be these consumers of gifts at certain times of the year before we were, you know, cognitively capable of understanding what we were doing. Our most valuable thing to give to somebody was our time. And, and I still carry that with me, I think, obviously. So we, fortunately, we didn't have any money for gifts anyway. So, so we didn't place value in, in this physical, you know, this material stuff. Um, but other than that, it was, it was a little awkward, you know, going to school, I was like the awkward Jehovah's witness kid. And, was that something that your your mom implemented, or was it your dad? Uh, and and if you can, I know she haven't mentioned him. What uh, what what was uh, kind of the dynamic with him? I mean, did, did, was he completely absent in your childhood? Or uh, no, that the Jehovah's Witness was sort of implemented from my mother. Mm-hmm. My father, he wasn't. They separated before I was born. He was very much in in the picture as much as he could be. Um, one of the things about my father is he. Uh, only actually got to meet his mother, I think, on two occasions or, or three occasions. Um, and so my dad's been kind of a wanderer. And even though that's kind of how he's treated us, but my brother and I, were super understanding and he does the best that he can do. Yeah. You know? and, and that's just the way he is. So although he wasn't there every day for us, um, he did his best and we we really appreciate that. And, and in fact, he's like a phenomenal dad now. Yeah. Like he, so you he's, have a good relationship. Yeah, very him. good relationship. Yeah, that's so, cool. Yeah, so we lived with just my mom, and she's kind of the one that sort of imposed that Jehovah's yeah. Witness lifestyle on us. Yeah. Is she is she still a practicing Jehovah's Witness? She is, yes, she <laughs> yeah. is. Do you fuck with her about it? Um, I used to. We would get into <laughs> arguments to the point of like almost tears, you know, because yeah. because I I fell away from that. Yeah, and um, she actually fell away from it for a little while. Yeah. Um, it's a real sad story. She in fact got like excommunicated from the religion for a while because of something beyond her control. Yeah. Um, it was, it's just a real sad story. So she, I, I can tell within her, she lost her identity amongst that group of people. Yeah. So, so she was hurt for a while, but that, that's actually the the catalyst for what allowed my brother and me to escape because once she went back in, we decided to stay out. We, yeah. we, and she didn't mind, you know, yeah. we were already old enough and yeah. But yeah, she's still very much practicing. That's some wild shit. Uh, you know, for 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 what it's worth, I guess the uh, you know I've met a handful of Jehovah's Witness, and I've you know Mormon is another kind of sect. I think that 
uh, typically gets mocked and ridiculed a little bit. But I will say about it, you know, I've, I've not met a Jehovah's Witness or a Mormon to this day that I thought was a bad person. I mean, that's one thing I, I will give both whatever you want to call, you know, whether you call it a, a sect or a denomination, you know, what what have you. But is that is that focus on on just being fucking good people and and you know, I, I do really like the element of, of valuing time and, and being, you know, essentially anti-materialistic. I think, uh, you know, the world could use a lot more of that. I, I don't particularly subscribe to the, you know, incorporating and into, uh, you know, the, the crutch of religion in, in cer- certain aspects of, of being uber religious about it. And in certain ways, I mean, that's a whole nother podcast. But uh, can, can you uh, briefly outline what uh what what does it mean to be a jehovah's witness like what what's the distinction so jehovah's witness take a take a very different view on what it means to be alive um they believe uh jesus is not lord obviously jesus is the son of god jehovah um and they are very much an end of days or at least historically they were an end of days kind of cult uh, started in the 1800s by this man named Charles Taz Russell, who was actually kind of a fraud. He was like a he had been arrested for selling magic wheat bread and all these like <laughs> you don't say. <laughs> yeah, it was like so they what what they essentially believe is that there is no real such thing as as heaven or hell. It's a paradise, and you're you have to pretty much conform to their way of life, and you'll grant you'll be granted access into this paradise after Armageddon. So you have a chance to to convert right now, and then when Armageddon does happen, uh, you will you know effortlessly go right into this paradise where everything is perfect and everyone lives forever. And if, however, you die um, without having converted, then you the Jehovah's Witnesses don't believe in a hell. So when you're dead, you're just dead. Yeah. Um, there is no consciousness there. You just miss out on an eternal <laughs> yeah, bliss. You just, just didn't in get paradise. invited to the party. Yeah. No invite. What, what's the uh, like? What's one or two things that that you know may surprise people? Like in in terms of the the super stringent or, or strict uh, elements that that you're not allowed to do or that that they impose on you that you that most people would be like, what the fuck? So you're bringing up one of the main points of contention between my mother and me when yeah. we argue, and it's it's uh, I, I'm pretty sure it's in the Book of Psalms. There's mention of of I don't I'm not sure if it's Psalms actually, but it's something about raw animal blood or blood in general, the consumption of blood. Um, and that prevents them from ever receiving a blood transfusion. So this is why people die. This is why Prince, who was a Jehovah's Witness, oh, sure. refused to get uh, to have surgery and was addicted to all these pills because he couldn't have the surgery because it required a blood transfusion, which inevitably it killed him. And he he could have just had a transfusion, had the operation, and survived. This is from what I know. I'm not 100 percent certain. This is yeah. what I've I've heard from other credible sources. But it's it's this lack of belief in you know this scientific understanding of of the good that a blood transfusion can do. Their absolute refusal to to comply with this is is astounding. So I mean, and it's and it's essentially based on a literal translation of of one passage in the Bible. That it is Jesus. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm I'm equally as shocked that Prince was a fucking Jehovah's Witness. Yeah, Prince, Michael Jackson, <laughs> all, 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 a lot of wild famous shit. people. It's strange. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that is wild. Uh, all right, so growing up in New Jersey and and in that kind of you know uh, subsidized housing type of environment, was there was there an element of that that you know you, you see depicted in in kind of pop culture, whether it's movie shows, music, uh, that that was kind of that like holy shit, like this is some rough you know, drugs and gangs and, and shit like that? Or was it was it more even keeled than that? What, what was that like? There were there were shootouts. And there was a lot of drugs. There was uh, all these things that you see in movies, but I'm only, I, I can only witness it now from that external perspective, observer's perspective. Mm-hmm. Uh, while I was in it, those guys that were the, the gangbangers, the drug dealers, the drug users, because we all lived in that community, they took care of us. They took care of my brother and me. They were, we were just part of that community. Yeah, group part of the tribe yeah so yeah. so it, it was really strange once i grew up and got out of it and and realized what it was that kind of like self-containing yeah. bubble that that is yeah so i i, I appreciated them I, sure. I didn't know maybe not so much anymore today but i appreciated them because all i knew was hey these older guys like you know they're, they're bad guys in fact 
one of the coolest things was they knew my brother and my family were Jehovah's Witness to take it back to that. So they would, during Halloween, they would get multiple masks and they would uh, go circle the, the neighborhood, collect a bag of candy, and then circle the neighborhood again with a different mag- bag, collect a bag of candy, meet my brother and me behind a, a bush and hand us one of the bags because oh, we, sure. weren't, we weren't allowed to, to go trick-or-treating. So it was like this sort of, yeah. they took care of us. I mean, some shit you'd never think gangbangers would do. Nope. Like, that's some wild shit. Yeah. That's fucking funny, man. God damn. Who, who knew they had uh, such a heart for the Jehovah's <laughs> Witness kids, right? That's fucking priceless. It is. Um, in terms of the dynamic between your brother, I mean, I'm assuming it sounds like your brother and, and you were fairly close growing up. Is that still still the case? Or? Yeah, we're, we're really close. Yeah. I think what, my what brother does he do? I, he's actually um, moving on up the executive ladder at, at a major worldwide company corporation yeah. uh, he works at verizon oh, okay. and uh he actually just got a insane um uh he got uh what's the word I'm promotion looking? promotion yeah. that's it no shit yeah so yeah, he's cool. doing real well you know my uh, coming from where we came from yeah because of my mother's work ethic having both of us witness that um i think we we both adopted that and were able to vastly improve our station in life yeah. which i'm i fully appreciate you know yeah. having learned that yeah. From my mother. And uh, and you have a sister also? I do, yeah. yeah. My sister, I don't I don't hang out with her or talk to her as much. Yeah. Uh, she, you know, got pregnant and moved out at a, at a young age. So I, I had never had quite the relationship with her that I do yeah. with my brother. Yeah. Um, but she's also 10 years older than me. So oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. She, there was also that, that disparity between. Yeah, them. sure. Was there any, uh, I mean, other than the, the trick-or-treating and, and uh, just kind of growing up in that environment, was there any, like landmark huge impactful moments uh, as a child growing up in that environment that, uh, that that inspired you to whether it's you know joining the navy other than and then the movie predator but you know were there any moments kind of growing up that really defined your existence from from your perspective looking back on it you know uh there's several uh in fact you know, I, I don't mean to be taking it back continuously to the JW yeah. side, but I remember, I remember being young and curious and every kid loves dinosaurs. I mean, who are we kidding? Every kid loves dinosaurs. Yeah. And I remember turning to a family member and saying, what were dinosaurs here for? Trying to, you know, understand this in my head, um, see how it fit with the religion. And the response was, uh, oh, I don't know. They were here to flatten the earth and get it ready for humans. <laughs> yeah. I, I remember, I tell you, I took a snapshot at that moment. I can tell you what I was wearing, which direction I was facing, what the person that said that was wearing, because that was the moment I grew up. You called bullshit. That was the moment I was like, <laughs> this is the stupidest reason, the stupidest uh, excuse for dinosaurs yeah. I've ever heard. So yeah. I was like, at that moment, I knew. And it, and I guess in my in my like more scientific minded, my skeptical minded, that is... Uh, one of the tipping points uh, moments that you're talking about as in terms of, of, you know, one wanting to be a seal and a hard worker, I would say my mother's work ethic. She, Mm -hmm. she came from, you know, poverty stricken. Our grandparents, my grandparents were illiterate. They couldn't read or write. Uh, My parents barely made it through elementary or uh, middle school, elementary school in my mom's case. Um, and still she had, she had it in her to work the necessary hours, 18 hour days sometimes. Yeah. And we never went without food. There was always rice and beans and sometimes government cheese, which that stuff was le- legit. I mean, <laughs> I love that stuff. <laughs> yeah, that's um, fucking great. But we always had food on the table. And, yeah. and I, I think I recognized that really early on. I, yeah. I, I one of the m- most, uh, one of the proudest moments for me that I'm most uh, gracious for is that ability. I don't know where it came from to recognize that she was actually busting her ass. Yeah. So as kids, we never asked for much. We didn't like make my mom, you know, do much for us or spend much for us. Um, but yeah, really she, she was kind of like a major driving force. I think it's neat that, you know, it sounds like at an early age, you guys not just recognize that, but appreciated it, you know, yeah. because I think, you know, not to sound like the old, the old whippersnapper guy, but it it really does seem like in today's day and age with technology and resources being as, as plentiful and bountiful as they are, uh, that very, that gets lost on most kids. I think even when they see their parents working their ass off is that I don't, I don't think that there's probably the degree with which 
would be helpful that that gets recognized and appreciated. But uh, it's neat to hear that, that you guys did. Um, what age did you lose your innocence in the dinosaur? Question? <laughs> I had to be nine or 10, maybe. Yeah. I was young and I was like, this is ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> That's the dumbest shit I've ever heard. Seriously. Did you say that to him? I, I, I mean, the look on my face must yeah. have been so stupefied <laughs> that they could read that. Yeah, that's fucking great. Um, did you have a, an actual, like a, like a tangible motivation to serve or was it just the inspiration of, of movies and thinking like, fuck, that's awesome. Like, was there more, any, any element of like patriotism and serving the greater good or, or was it, you know, I did. And, and obviously I, not that I know many other, you know, countries or, or societies other than this. Um, I obviously, I love this country. I think it's the greatest, obviously we can always do better, but I think it's the greatest, I mean, in ter- in every facet. Um, as I get older, however, as people ask me that question, what, you know, what inspired or what motivates me, I find that I'm, I can give those, those one-off, two-off answers, responses like, yeah, you know, I love my country. I, I wanted to serve amongst the most elite, but I think, I think if you take motivation or inspiration and you can distill it if you can put it in a centrifuge and kind of spin it and spin it spin it and then figure out what's at the very core of that i've been able to identify two things um and i'm i welcome any other input um but i think inherently there's like a deep-seated insecurity that i have yet to identify and i think which i think i find funny about the intro to this podcast i think a wantingness to be a desire to be wanted or relevant amongst certain peer groups, amongst, you know, family and friends. I think these two things, although I haven't, like I said, identified that insecurity, I think I do things. I, I want to learn this about myself. So it's an ongoing journey to to try to identify those tipping points in my in my past. So I could say, yeah, I, I was deeply inspired by patriotism, which there, you know, to a certain degree, you're right, I was, um, and I'm motivated by certain other things, but I, I want to go further back. I still haven't identified it yet, though. Yeah. There are insecurities that I have yet, and it's a wantingness to be desired yeah. by women, yeah. you know, relevant amongst men. Yeah. And um, I, w- I still am in the process of exploring. Yeah. It's interesting you say that. I, I think, uh, unquestionably, I, I think there's a there's a recurring theme within, you know, our community of, of special operators that uh, that's very prominent. Um, as it relates to that. And, and I know I'm in the exact same boat as that, you know, there's a huge element of patriotism, whatever, but I, you know, I got the shit beat out of me. I got jumped a couple times in high school, which I talk about in, in my first book and, and, uh, I won't beat that, that horse, but, um, but I think exactly what you said is that there's an element of, of wanting to be, whether it's desired or needed or appreciated or revered, Part of it, I think, is being a guy, a type, even remotely type A personality. I think, you know, men are a little more genetically ingrained to, to, to have that be a component that they, that they truly need. You know, and I think relationship wise, when men feel like they're, you know, either not respected, not desired, or, or they're kind of cast away, casted away, or, or, uh, you know, not in that, like, yeah, I don't really give a shit. Like, I, I think that's the most dangerous and poisonous thing in, in a relationship for men. Um, you know, and I, th- but I, th- I think, you know, a lot of us live our lives that way. And so, you know, that, that's an influence that we have in our jobs and our, in our personal relationships, professional relationships, peer groups, you name it, that, that exists. And it's, uh, I'm glad you brought that up because I, it's something that, that I think it's, it's, it's very poignant in, uh, you know, in, in the male psyche and especially in, in our line of work. Um, did you, did, did you find, I guess, that, that there were similar elements of that and guys that, uh, that you served with? Yeah. And I find that I get questions by young folk who want to go to buds all the time. I'm sure your Instagram yeah. DMS are just full of these questions. And you, you read these comments that are like, I, I just want to, you know, I, I love this country and I want to fight for this country. And I, that's great that that's what you feel now, but, uh, I want, to know the deep seated reason why. Yeah. And I, I think I see that in a lot of people I see, I, I'm envious of people like Lao Tzu, you know, who, who created Taoism because of his, his ability to, to create this ideology and then believe it so fully that he disappeared into the, he, he climbed, he went beyond the, the, the border of whatever dynasty uh, location it was and disappeared. No one know, knew what happened. He believed in it so much. He didn't stick around 
didn't require relevancy. We, I think we inherently deeply revere this notion of building a cabin in the woods and detaching, you know, this, this is, we love this. We fantasize about this, but it's so hard to do. Um, and I think, um, I don't know. I, I think, um, our ability to, or inability to detach in that way is somehow tied to a wantingness, a a relevancy. I see that in every, in every team guy. And and I don't, I'm not ballsy enough to go ask like, okay, what's your real reason to be here? You know, (laughs) what are you insecure about, bro? Yeah. Yeah. But I I think it's there. I think if we're going to be totally honest with ourselves, we can say, you know, I'm here because similar to you as a Jehovah's witness, I wasn't allowed to have friends. I was cornered in the hallways at, at mid middle school and picked on and beat up on. And one of the guys that I thought was a friend of mine, uh, back in like fifth grade, I found out from somebody else that he refused to ever admit he was even a friend of mine and I mm-hmm. wasn't allowed to have, and this lack of relevancy amongst my peers, I think has a huge part in why I wanted to be not just relevant, but I wanted to be, like you said, appreciate, appreciated and a necessity and, yeah. and nowhere else in the world are you more necessary yeah. than carrying a gun and protecting the guy to your right and your left. You know, yeah. that, I think that's the, that's the most, I, I guess you can say, the, the deepest form of relevancy. Yeah. And um, so I think that's, that's. Yeah, no, it's, that that's, a, that's a great point. And I, I uh, thinking about it as you're explaining it is, is that, um, you know, not to get too far off in the weeds, but fuck it, it's mic dropped. That's what we do is Let's go do off it. in the fucking tangents is that um, I, I think that some insecurity is, is not only a good thing, but I actually think it's fucking necessary and required for human beings to continue to exist. Uh, and I think the reason for that is that a little bit of insecurity, you know, breeds competition, breeds drive. Because, you know, to me, you know, having zero fucks to give when it when it relates to what anybody else thinks and, and whatever, uh, or, or how you feel your lot in life is, I think breeds complacency, yeah. you know, because if you, if you truly don't give a fuck about anything, you know, like then w- what is your motivation to do any fucking thing? Like it, it can't just be internally, you know, that there has to be some element to that. And I think that that's probably one of the reasons human beings ex- exist is because there's an element of insecurity that drives us to do better, you know, uh, and it's something that just the term insecure or insecurity, I think, you know, I don't know anybody that, that attaches any positive association with that, but I think, you know, just like with anything I talk about balance and here I'll bring it up again is that, you know, there's, there's an element of obviously, you know, it's like Tabasco sauce a little bit goes a long fucking way. Like if you're, if you're dumping insecurity all over your fucking dinner, that is your life, uh, you know, then, then yeah, it's going to be in, incredibly negative and it's going to affect all your relationships. But I think a little bit is, uh, is positive. Yeah. Then you get, then you get into that weird scenario where, because I completely agree with you, I think it, it is necessary and it's what, what we might deem as this negative, you know, insecurity, it actually ends up being this positive force for us, or at least it's yeah. a, it's a catalyst in a positive direction in our lives. So then you're, you exist in this quandary, like, well, am I angry because I was hurt this way or yeah. do I you know, do I thank that person yeah. or this scenario for hurting me this way because I wouldn't be where I am yeah. because of this insecurity. So Yeah. Well, I know, you know, I, I try to use a lot of analogies with dogs because that's what I essentially do for a living. Um, you know, the, and, and you see it with people, you know, you're a great example of, of, uh, you know, having a childhood that if you look at the kind of the broad spectrum of the, of the American experience, you know, it, it's a tougher upbringing than say your average, um, you know, and, and, there's a lot of examples of, of people who have been through those types of experiences that have both used that and, and despite that, uh, been able to do some pretty fucking amazing things. And, and I know with dogs, like there's an element of what I, I consider or call um, structured stress. Excuse me. Uh, it's very calculated. It's, it's designed. But, you know, as, as young dogs are growing up, like you're not coddling and coddling them, you're, you're deliberately, uh, and, and intentionally putting elements of stress in, in a lot of different ways. Some of it's environmental, some of it's physical, some of it's mental, sometimes it's all three of them, but it's gotta be scaled back to what they can take, but it's enough to, to develop a threshold, you know, no different than working out or holding your breath or fucking whatever is that, um, 
you know, stress just like any other stimuli is is one that that uh, you know it can either ruin you or uh, overstimulate you, or or you can you know be freaked out by it, or you can get used to it and ultimately be able to deal with a ton of it if it's um, you know graduated and scaled appropriately. And so um, you know, again, I just like with everything else, balance wise, there, there can be way too much of that. Uh, but there's an element of, of if there's none of that, you get these coddled snowflake pussies that can't, can't fucking, I mean, they can't hear a word without, you know, retreating to a fucking safe space. Like to me, that's beyond pathetic. You know, um, I'm curious. I mean, now that we're talking about it, like being a combat veteran team guy at a place like Columbia university, cause I mean, that's largely, it's a pretty liberal university. What was that experience like? Did, did, did you find yourself at odds? Did you start to not necessarily emulate, but, um, you know, uh, I guess sympathize with some of that or what, uh, what was that like? I, 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 in a way I sympathize with it, but I think Columbia university gets a bad rep because although, although there are protests occasionally, there are, there might be one or two students that makes a big fuss. It, there's a tendency to apply that to all the students. And yeah. that just doesn't, that's not the case. In my experience, yeah. They just don't care. Like the students, you don't have enough time at Columbia to care yeah. about a lot of this stuff unless yeah. you're studying something that's, you know, kind of easy, yeah. which even the easy subjects at Columbia are, are insanely difficult. Um, but I don't, I don't, I also don't necessarily blame that safe space syndrome on the youth. I, I think it's the older generation who, who, who for, yeah, know, for sure. allows this to happen. Or in yeah. fact, it might be the older generation who, who, um, you know, creates this notion in the first place. I think millennials get a bad rep, um, these, these kids today, but you know, at Columbia university, I, I didn't see it as often. Yeah. It could be that I was too busy studying math and maybe it was there, but the reality is I, most students, like I said, are, are super busy and yeah. I didn't see any safe spaces. I, there were warnings at the beginning of some classes, like, Hey, look, there's going to be conversations about this and that. Does anybody have a problem with it? No. Nope. All right, let's get into it. Yeah. And no one cared. Yeah. No, that's, that's a really good point you bring up of the, uh, it is created. I mean, the fact is, is, you know, just like a, a year old puppy, that's a total fucking asshole. Like it's, it's not because he's an asshole. It's because you've allowed him to be an asshole. I mean, it really is. And so, you know, I, I bust millennials chops all the time. One, because it's fun, of course. uh, you know, and, and two, because it's, it's, uh, it, it's the result of, you know, in my opinion, shitty parenting and, and a society that has placed a, an, an overabundance of, of importance on not hurting people's feelings. And unfortunately they're the, they're the byproduct of it in a lot of ways. But, uh, but that is a, an important distinction to make for sure is that it's, it's the people in positions of, of leadership and, and authority that have allowed those things to take place that are ultimately at blame. And that, that is an important distinction for sure. Um, We'll get back into the Columbia stuff. I would like to just because you, you spent, you know, fucking nine years as a SEAL and three combat deployments. Can you kind of walk us through your your uh, your team guy experience from uh, from when you joined and and, uh, and moving through it? Yeah. So prior to going to Bud's, I was a I was an athlete. I was a cross country runner. In fact, I had like scholarships and I was my team was sponsored by Adidas in the college that I went to before joining. Um, I was a runner and a swimmer in, in high school. I did all these things in preparation for for um, buds. So I knew for a long time that that's what I wanted to do. Can I, can I interrupt and ask what your fastest one mile time? About is? a four twenty eight. Four twenty eight. Jesus. Yeah. Um, I ran about a four forty two in high school, and yeah. then when I got to my first year in, in college, I ran sub four thirty. I was yeah. never able to never able to beat you know that time. Yeah. That's fucking quick though. <laughs> yeah. It's good shit. Sorry, go ahead. No. Um, so, uh, so I, in preparation for it, uh, like I said we, earlier, I did a lot of reading to, <clears throat> to minimize those, those surprises. So I joined the Navy. I show up, I actually never graduated college. I, I went through about a year and a half. Uh, I got injured really bad right before a, a track meet and, um, I was doing like a trail run and I busted up my ankle pretty bad. So I was out for the rest of the season. So my focus wasn't necessarily on school. It was on the athletics. So I pulled out, healed up, you know, worked and trained and then trained, trained, trained. A few months later, I left for the Navy boot camp. I got to mention boot camp because my boot camp story is pretty amazing. Yeah. Uh, it was completely unfair. 
Um, and I mean unfair for everybody else and yeah. insanely awesome for me. <laughs> yeah. um, so I'm going to highlight that. Uh, I, I had 2,400 vision, so I was never actually allowed to go to Buds. Jesus. Um, I had Can six, you see me right now? Oh, I had surgery. <laughs> yeah, no, Fortunately, I like right during sniper school, I got yeah. surgery, so I was yeah. able to even see my trace yeah. on those rounds. Fucking bionic eyeballs. Yeah. So um, at boot camp, I, I did such a good job because I was a runner and, a, and an athlete that my my – uh, RDC or the drill instructor, this is the Navy calls him. He uh, forged a signature, helped me forge a signature for my eyesight to get me placement in yeah. buds. So shout, shout out to that RDC. Man. I still talk to him. <laughs> oh, I still talk, and I, I helped his kid. Yeah. His kid That's went to buds. Uh, I think he's in, or he went to EOD and he's an EOD guy now. So no uh, I still talk to him. Yeah. Damn, that's awesome. Paying it forward. Yes, sir. And, um, so I get, I can make it through there. I ended up going through like weather school, AG weather school <laughs> in the no Navy. Fucking way. Yeah. Fucking weatherman. I love it. But I love the science and I love clouds. In fact, moving here from New York City is one of the best things when people ask me, what do you like it? Is the ability to see the clouds and yeah. see the, the horizon and the sunrise and sunsets. They're just the most yeah. beautiful things here. It can't be beat. You'd, you'd uh, trip out at the fucking what it looks like out here at night, like with no lights and, and open sky. It's fucking it's yeah, awesome. Yeah, you got to get a telescope here yeah. for sure. Oh, you'll have to hook me up with which one. Yeah. I, don't, I don't have a fucking clue about that I'll stuff. I'll send you some good stuff. Yeah. So uh, I Can, went... Can I can I ask real quick? To, sure. Can you tell me like Weatherman School? I I gotta know what the fuck that was like. Like how long is it and what? It's 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 four months long. So I in fact I went to the recruiter um, prior to bo uh, boot camp and asked for a short school. I said, "Give me anything. I just want to get to buds." <laughs> yeah. And they gave me. In fact, the recruiter was a seal. He was yeah. like a dive motivator back in twenty two thousand three two thousand two. Yeah. And he gave me AGA school, and I was yeah. like, "All right." Turns out I'm like I, I love clouds i love weather so i was yeah. like geeked out so yeah. we, you, you learn meteorology and oceanography yeah um and you learn like different weather patterns you learn cloud types and all the different you know happenings with weather um and it just so happens to be at down in biloxi mississippi where yeah. the hurricane hunters are uh the c-130s so um went to that school geeked out on that for a while then i got orders to buds uh straight from that and then i i showed up to buds class 253 um made it through first time um, no, I, fortunately I was, I didn't get rolled in any phase. Uh, I made it through and graduated both buds and SQT with two, five, three. Um, then I, I checked into team one, uh, team one was, was, you know, it was a good time. Yeah. I, you hear all this, you know, the, the gossip about the different teams and the various potential like, uh, attitudes per team. But, you know, nowadays doesn't really exist because GWAT kind of conformed all the teams in a way. Yeah. So I was a little afraid, a little hesitant about Team One, having heard like Rudy Bosch and the high yeah. and tight haircuts. And that stall log one is what yeah, they call it. yeah it was exactly. Yeah. So uh, got to Team One, you know, did did a uh, an Iraq deployment in 2007 with with Charlie Platoon, um, and that's where I was mentioning when when Debbie Lee, yeah, um, you had her on a podcast and she mentioned going back to Ramadi to Camp Markley to yeah. visit Charlie Platoon. That was that was that's my awesome. guys, yeah. Um, so that was awesome to see her there. It was crazy. It had to be a powerful experience. It was. And Mark's mom there, you know? It's like, it's almost, it causes stagnation. Like, I don't know what to do. Like, yeah. I, I hug this lady, you know, I, I embrace this lady, but I, I don't know what to say. I freak yeah. out. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it's kind of like, what can you say? Yeah. You know? And yeah, like, thank neat. you for, for coming. That's insane of you. Yeah. But it's, because yeah. 2007 was still, was not like, Ramadi wasn't yet yeah. entirely pacified. Um, But then I, I came back after that deployment um, oh, prior to that deployment, one of the, one of the lucky things about me and, and, and I'm super grateful for is my, uh, I checked into SEAL team one and they had just left on deployment. So although I wanted to go over there and be like their bougie boy, go do the cleanup duties, they didn't let me go. I had to stay back in 2005. Um, but I got to go to all the cool schools. I got to go to sniper. I got to go to JTAC that, you know, calling in close air support. I got to go to comm school. I got to go to all these different schools. So I was this new guy that had all the qualifications, yeah. which needless to say, you know, drew some, yeah. some I drew some fire for it. Cause yeah. I'm like, what the fuck? New yeah. guys getting, yeah. O older guys couldn't operate without me. Cause yeah. I satisfied all these different, you know, yeah. qualifications needed. Yeah. So they were, they were not the happiest. <laughs> <laughs> That's a shit sandwich, man. Um, so I, I received my share, my fair share of hazing, yeah. um, whatever. Back, back when you still fucking could. Yeah. Oh uh, yeah. Yeah. It was, it was pretty serious too. Yeah. Um, so did that platoon, uh, did another, de did two, actually two other deployments, one to Afghanistan and then one again 
right back to the same place in Ramadi and then the hit yeah. uh, Fallujah area. Yeah. Um, and then after about five or six years at the team, I went and became an instructor over at Trade at Land Warfare. Yeah. So I taught like open and closed terrain warfare, long range target interdiction, sniper stuff. I taught the JTAC stuff. I kind of did a little bit of everything. Yeah. Until uh, until about 2012 when I decided to pull the pull the you know pull trucks. Yeah. yeah. And get out of there. In terms of your so I mean three combat deployments is is pretty significant. I mean. Is there is there anything that you can share from from those deployments that uh, you know kind of you know separate or distinguish your experience and, and perspective from doing it? Because I know you know politics are are generally not a huge element of of when you go over there and and uh, you know ultimately when bullets are flying like none of it fucking matters. But uh, you know was was the dynamic of, of when you were there, did that play a role or did, uh, you know, kind of what was that experience like for you? So one of the most interesting things that happened to me when I was over there was, you know, you, you go into this environment on deployment and you're in super aggressive mode. You want to utilize all those skills that you've learned. And, and I, I tended to associate the Iraqis with zombies, you know, like I was like, Oh, the zombie zombies are just easy to kill, yeah. you know? But then you get there and you realize, uh, you, you see these people, you see them in their daily life, and it's it's hard to maintain that aggressiveness to everyone, especially for me, who, when I saw those youngsters running around, I saw myself, yeah. you know? So it, it, brought a bit, it brought way more humanity than I anticipated. And then I realized, okay, I can't be this, it can't be all this aggressiveness. There yeah. has to be- Or it can't be mindless. Yeah, it can't yeah. be mindless. And and as a new guy, I'm talking about, as a yeah. new guy, you're always like, Ugh, I'm beating <laughs> yeah. your chest, like, let's get after it. And yeah. then you realize, okay, these are actually people. They're not like zombies, like mm -hmm. I thought. Um, so it kind of it obviously had a pretty big effect. It swayed my my more aggressive side. Yeah. Um, and, and, and I, I guess you can say I developed a, you know, more compassion for these people. And I, I, I wanted to be there more than, and do more than just kick doors. I wanted to, you know, do other things and what little things I could do. Like my first platoon guys, we, we had this, you know, little deal with each other. We'd always bring notebooks and pens and extra pencils and stuff. And when, whenever we'd see crowds of kids, we'd give them to the kids, especially the girls, we'd, we'd hand girls because yeah. we wanted them to learn to read or write because, yeah. you know, if the mothers can read or write, you know, then they, then, then, you know, later on it's with their permission that their kids are able to go fight for these, for these extremist sides, but without yeah. their permission, they can't fight. Yeah. And, and you can nail that by creating or, or help facilitating literate women who then read and understand a little bit about what their extremist side is doing. Yeah. And then they, they kind of hold back on letting their kids do that in the future. So we had this, and these kids are, I mean, hopefully they're adults now and they yeah. have like babies of their own. Cause this was back, you know, 11 years ago, 12 yeah. years ago. And uh, so, yeah, it brought a little bit more humanity to it than I, than I thought. Yeah. You know, I, I love hearing that. I mean, I know, for me, similarly, um, you know, I, I was there right at the the initial uh, invasion, uh, so to speak, and you know, not really having any fucking context or or idea as to what to expect. Similarly, I you know, you see people in day to day, like you you can relate, and and it's and it's very real, and it and it it, it muddies the water enormously that way, but in a good way. Yeah. Uh, because I, I think sometimes it can't be that black and white, and that's what separates a lot of special operations from more conventional units is the ability to think and make dynamic decisions on your feet that are outside the scope of what the playbook fucking says. But, um, <clears throat> you know, the 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 weird thing for me is thinking, you know, back when I was there in, in 03, like the, the kids that, that I remember seeing and handing MRE candy to and shit like that, are now fucking grown ass men. I mean, they're, I mean, they're grown ass men. I mean, if they were six, seven years old, I mean, they're in their fucking twenties and, and they could very well be fighting or, or maybe they're doing the opposite. And, and I think that's an element that, that maybe gets lost on a lot of people is, is the, the importance of that hearts and minds, uh, aspect. And, and just like with everything, you know, again, hitting, hitting the balance component is that, it can't be to the point where you're getting taken advantage of and, and your own guys are getting slaughtered because you're being, you know, overly generous. But, uh, but on the same token, you know, there has to be an element of, of investment, uh, into, 
into those communities, into the culture, into the uh, government structure, into uh, resources and infrastructure of, of facilities and roads and bridges and schools and hospitals and that kind of shit. Or, you know, what's the point? You know, you're going to you're going to be fighting an endless fucking battle. And from a political standpoint, I mean, one of the things I'm I'm pretty big on as I get older and have been out, I mean, I've been out almost 10 years now, which is hard to fucking wrap my mind around in some ways. But, um, you know, when I look at uh, the decision to do anything foreign policy wise, I have a much more. I would call it, you know, pragmatic viewpoint and in terms of um, not wanting to get involved unless it's absolutely fucking necessary. And and if it is, then it's the gloves are off and you do whatever the fuck you have to to, to get the job done. But um, do you find yourself uh, transitioning, I guess, a little bit from the time when you were a young barrel chested freedom fighter to to now uh, as as being older and being out and kind of seeing the real world is, is your perspective and, and paradigm shifted that way? I 100%. Yeah. And I, I say that I understand our foreign policy involves um, certain resources that may, you know, we can acquire or, or that we have to protect for our allies or for ourselves. Where I am today, however, is I want to be more aggressive, but, but I'm not, and I not in the way to, to acquire any more resources. I say, if we're going to be the righteous country and with the righteous values that we say we have, we need to step in when there's genocide in places with no, with no strings attached, Mm -hmm. understanding let's get those boys to work because they want to work. They want to do stuff. Let's be aggressive and let's put an end to these like genocides and whatnot and, and understand that we're not extracting oil. We're not extracting anything. So it's, I get it that why we don't involve ourselves in, in oftentimes in things like this, but I say, if we want to be, like I said, that righteous country, let's get to work on those on those things. Let's let's save people yeah. without those strings. If you're if you're going to lead by example, you got to do it in in every case. Yeah, I mean, we're rich. We yeah. have money. We have, uh, yeah. you know, we're a fairly rich country. Yeah, we can afford to. to yeah, I, I agree uh, in most respects. I think you know the 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 tough part or the 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 impossible decision that I I find myself struggling with is that you know, what, what makes it all worth it, you know, is that, you know, there, there's enough atrocity and, and shitty deals going on to where even with as big and powerful as a nation as we are, we, we don't have the resources to involve ourselves in every case. Um, having said that, you know, one, how do you, how do you choose which one is more grave than the other and, and requires our involvement, but B, you know, I hate to sound like a, like an insensitive or, or lacking empathy prick, but, you know, when I look at guys like you and I, and I know I've got a ton of friends that are now gone and I know you do too, is it, is it worth it? You know, and, and that's the part that I, I find myself struggling with, I think a lot of times and, and tends to lend itself to my mentality being a little more isolationist and a little more hands off is that, you know, are, are the lives of, of some of the greatest men I've ever had the pleasure of walking the earth with, uh, was, was their life worth you know, what, what's continuing to, to take place overseas. And, and I don't, I don't have a good justification for that. I, I don't know that I would say yes. You know, in fact, I would say a resounding no in most cases. What, what's your take on that? I, you know, I, I, I would leave that to them. Yeah. It, it, was it worth it to them? Obviously if had I, you know, had I been killed in Iraq or Afghanistan, I believed in the mission enough at that time where I was okay with it. I had, like Jocko says, the will to die for the for the cause. Um, so I don't take it any further than that moment that they sacrificed. Mm-hmm. Uh, they did a thing. They protected their brothers. You know, they they gave their all. And I mean, that doesn't. What happens today? Yeah, it kind of sucks because we're privileged to see the outcome. We we got to continue going on. Yeah. But that in no way takes anything away from the caliber. Of person that they are, the 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 quality, the sacrifice they made. Yeah. Um, I find that if I do go down that dark web, you know, I can I can get it, into it, some pretty sad places. Yeah, I can get shitty real quick. I agree, and I that's a great point. Though I think the thing that 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 tends to influence my mentality towards that is is the is the people that are making the decisions for where guys like you and I go, and, that, and to me, that's what kind of ruins it. You know, is that is that we have a much more idealistic viewpoint in terms of what we're doing and why we're doing it. But when you, you know, the longer I'm out, the older I get, the more, you know, behind the curtain, 
you kind of get to see when you watch political hearings and, and, you know, granted a lot of it's bullshit and some of it's cherry picked in terms of the media, what they allow you to see versus not. But, but the reality of it is, is that, you know, and this is on both sides of the aisle is that when senators and congressmen uh, go in being worth X and when they, you know, four years or, or 26 years later are now worth 10, 20, 50, a hundred times that making, you know, 180 a year. And now they're worth 49 million. Like that's a fucking problem. You know, and, 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 and it becomes very, very difficult for me to, to be okay with some of the, the decisions that they make in sending guys like us who, who our intentions may be as pure as the driven fucking snow, uh, you know, when it comes to why we're doing what we're doing. But when it comes to, you know, why they're sending us to where they're sending us, there's, there's a lot of ulterior bullshit there. And that's the, that's the heartburn I have with yeah. it. But. I think we, like I said, we have the luxury of that kind of hindsight. However, and as and I agree with you 100%, I just don't think there's any way you could take me or you right now and convince me or you back then of yeah. this. You oh, know, yeah. This is obviously yeah. what comes with yeah. with age and perspective growth. For sure. Yeah. And, and you know, that's why uh, the military, I mean, that's not the only reason, but that's one of the reasons why it's a young man's game, yep. you know, is that uh, fit, a lot of it's physical, obviously. I, I don't think physically I could, I could operate uh, anywhere near the capacity that I, that I could, uh, back then. But, um, but yeah, no, those are, those are great points. I, I love, I love hearing the perspective of, of different guys that have had similar experiences, but in different, uh, you know, contextual associations to, to talk about that kind of stuff. Um, anything else seal career wise that, uh, that, that is worth mentioning in terms of, uh, just any experiences you had that, that, shaped kind of what what you're doing now and, and getting out and all that i mean when when you did decide to get out what kind of what led to that anything in particular so there was like you know in in there's bureaucracy in every in every aspect of life um i i personally couldn't stand the successive heartbreaks that i was that i kept getting from the leadership i i was aching for another deployment and another i wanted to be that hard charging i wanted to continue getting after it I got into an instructor billet and, and I begged and pleaded with the master chief at the, at the time, if he would allow me to take about four months out of the two years to be, you know, to go do an, another augment, another short deployment. And he promised me, yes, absolutely. If I were capable of, of qualifying for that MTS, that ma uh, master training specialist within the first year of me being an instructor. I would be afforded a four month block at the end of that or at sometime in that second year. And so me and another guy that were um, at this training cell at the time, we busted our ass. We learned the ins and outs of curriculum development, all these requirements that we had to which, which, satisfy. Let's be honest, that's some pretty sexy shit. <laughs> so sexy. It was <laughs> awful. But it was like, it was yeah. a stack of books that we yeah. had to memorize. Yeah. And we were able to, to study, take the exam, sit across the board and we crushed it, both of us individually. Um, and we got our MTS in about a month and a half, which is unheard of. Yeah. But we were so fortunately we were, tra we were training out in the desert where you have nothing but time yeah. when you're not training. Yeah. So we, all we were doing is studying and sleeping and training, studying and sleeping and training. Um, so as soon as I got this qualification, I was like, once again, hard charge. And I was like, Hey, look, like we got it. We're, we're good to go. Is, is it still, you know, a possibility? Nope. And it was just these kinds of heartbreaks that I had suffered and yeah. he had lied. And, and the reason being is from him on upward, it looks good because he has guys that qualified, you know, he look, look at the, on his resume or, or yeah. bullet points. Like, look, I got these guys to qualify, yeah. but it does nothing for us because yeah. he lied to us. So yeah. this guy, this guy's also a very famous guy for being a POS in, yeah. in the team. He should be out any month now. Yeah. Um, well, feel free to call him out <laughs> once he gets out. Yeah. Maybe. Oh, I will. Yeah. Um, but in terms of like, you know, one of the final things I want to say about my experience in the SEAL teams is, you know, one of the greatest insults you can be that can be ascribed to you in the SEAL teams, the, the worst thing you can be called is an individual. It's yeah. like, it's legit the worst thing. Yeah. I didn't have the greatest relationship with my first platoon chief. Mm -hmm. Um, and one day he insulted me. It was like a backhand insult. He he said, you know why you're such a good sniper? Because I was always tinkering with gear and coming up with ways, detection and, and stalking ways. And he, he insults me saying, you know why you're such a good sniper is because you're an individual. 
and and he left it at that and for years that bothered me for yeah. years is like the greatest insult you can tell someone yeah and it wasn't until about you know just a few years ago years after i got out that i realized what he thought was an insult actually ended up being you know one of the greatest compliments i've ever received cuz now that i'm out you know i understand the necessity of an individual being a bad thing in the teams yeah. but you're in civilian life the best thing you could be known as yeah. is an individual yeah. have your own nonconformist you know, yeah, yeah your own idea ideas your own perspective and and so one of the greatest lessons i took was that that was like yeah. you tried to insult me but now you know here i am an individual and i'm beating my chest over yeah. this like yeah. thank you it's amazing as a young frogman the uh how how powerful one fucking comment can be and and there's you know there's a number of experiences i had you know where i fucked up or got you know reprimanded or or my ass handed to me for for something uh you know whatever it is whether it's you know misplacing a piece of gear or you know fucking something i mean you name it but um you you know it, it is pretty pretty amazing i think as as human beings you know there there's really powerful impactful moments just like the dinosaur question just like you know, kind of, you know, pivots in your life that, that have profound impacts. And I think for me, at least, it seems like as you get older, those happen less, um, you know, is that like, there's only so many times that that can happen, at least in my experience where I'm truly like, I mean, I hate to use the word feeling enlightened, but, but, you know, where I'm just like, holy shit, like where my, my life gets turned upside down. And there's a, there's an element of, uh, um, of, of almost a, a jealousness I have of, of still having that level of naivete and in I certain agree. ways, like I, I wish I had that kind of innocence, yep. but the reality is, is I'm, I'm old and bitter as fuck at this point And there's a lot less of that going on, but what, uh, has that been your experience? Well, that's why I delve into the science yeah. and astronomy and astrophysics yeah. and math because keep getting your mind blown that, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, it will, it will, yeah. what you think will be one thing is yeah. actually 180 degrees yeah. the opposite, you know, yeah. and it's just, well, and then it just provides a new perspective, a new way of thinking. And yeah. that exists in science, in the frontier of science yeah. all the time, which is, you know, what I like. I, like you said, you know, those enlightenment points of enlightenment, I try to chase those because yeah. I, I love it. I love yeah. being, you Fly know, yeah, having, yeah. having what I, my, my deeply held beliefs or understandings flipped upside down yeah. that's it's exciting it's sure. scary and it's also exciting yeah no it's fucking good shit i mean so is that as you got out and decided you know what can you walk us through that process of so you get out of the navy and then you go to columbia like what walk us through that yeah okay. so my my intention was never to go to school in fact i hated school like i hated the the idea of math and science i despised it never any good at it um so i got out with the intention of contracting um, I was fortunate, however, to get a huge sum of money through the TSGLI and through other like injuries that I had. I was able to get like vast amounts where I didn't actually have to work for a few months. So I took, a, I decided to take a few months off, which ended up being a really bad thing. Because when you have no monetary worries, I think when you have no no issues like this and you have no accountability, yeah. no job, you have an unfettered free thought amount of time and things be get things become very scary you get to see scary aspects of the world i started i started to not have as much fun i would go out with friends and be at the club and you know i would be focused on the old lady that would be cleaning up and seeing that disparity like why do i get to stand here and why does she have to do this so i started seeing that and i started drinking i started drinking a lot and um i actually had to go through go get help i i went through this 52 week long prolonged exposure therapy for, for PTSD. Yeah. Cause, and it wasn't like therapy due to, to like survivor's guilt or, or traumatic, like anything of like that. It was, I walked into this, this office, this medical office after having been through like several psychologists that all kind of like, I just, I wasn't willing to open up to them, I guess. And I told them, I don't think I belong here. I think I, I, I just suffer from rage. And they were like, well, you definitely belong here because you know, what PTSD at the, what it means is like, it's a, it's a sharp spike in some kind of unwanted emotion or something that gets in the way. It's not just the survivor's guilt. And I found that I was getting angrier and angrier and, and, and drinking more. So it wasn't until about a year and a half later, after I got out of the military, you know, I would go get blacked out drunk with all my friends and, and I would always return home and put on astronomy videos and, and put on all this stuff. And my friends, space porn. Though. Yeah, I would. <laughs> I, I'm serious. 
So I, I, all my friends, I've had like two friends at the time say, you know what? You always talk about this stuff. Your apartment's full of astronomy DVDs and stuff. Why don't you just go to school? <laughs> so fucking random. I love it. And, and you know, every, every yeah. team guy has their niche. Yeah. Mine in the teams was yeah. astronomy. I yeah. mean, I, I carry, you can ask team guys uh -huh. that I, that I trained. I had a, a <laughs> telescope with me out in the desert. And That's they would make great. fun of me, yeah. you know, like, you're such a nerd. Why do yeah. you have a telescope out here? Yeah. But you're was, a peeping Tom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, out in the desert, there's no one to peep at. Yeah. Um, but, um, yeah, so eventually I went and I, I decided to go to school. I tried to give it a shot. And I realized I, I having always been a bad student, I, I never, like I said, nobody in my family has college. My brother is the only other one that has a high school diploma. Um, I had no idea how to study and no idea how to learn, graduated high school, like a 1.7 GPA, yeah. nothing, yeah. Uh, no idea. Um, so I decided, you know, I'm going to be a good student. Like I'm going to be a good student. So I, 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 I focused on all those things that were a distraction in my life and I got rid of them yeah. and I, I decided to go to school. I bought like a glass desk and I taped a white poster board underneath. I got white boards all over my walls. I put mar uh, dry erase markers in my bathroom mirror on my every window and glass door. And that way I could always have an, a reason to, to study or yeah. to learn or to be confronted with information. So I don't forget it. Yeah. And I That's used it as an excuse. Like if I got tired sitting down doing math, well, if you're tired, stand up, go yeah. to the wall, go to the mirror, go to the window yeah. and, and keep going, keep going. Cause I knew I was a bad student, but I had to beat that. It's like some uh, Goodwill hunting or fucking Rain Man shit, yeah. like a fucking house full of uh, dry erase. I, I, there, if that was here in this house, I think there'd be a bunch of uh, drawn dicks. And <laughs> oh, of course. There'd be cock and balls everywhere. And yeah, but uh, that's, that's, it's interesting. And I think it's cool that, you know, the, the psychology that exists uh, or the parallels in psychology that exists between dogs and, and people in that similarly, like when, the, when dogs have issues with things, you're, you're deflecting their attention from it. And, uh, I mean, you, you heard me on, on your way in doing a live chat with some of the online uh, folks, but that's the gist of it is that, you know, if a dog has an issue with X, you know, d don't expose them to X and try to work them through that. It's get them to focus on something else when X is present. Uh, and with dogs, it's easy because it's focus on me, you know, or focus on the handler, the, the owner, whatever, when, when that happens. But it sounds like there's a, there's a big element of that too, is that you created an environment in which you know, you could, you could always deflect any, any negative energy or, or whatever you were focused on or, or thoughts that, that were coming in that, that may lead down a negative path in terms of your actions could be easily deflected by just writing and, and working through shit. Is that, was that yeah. kind of the recipe for success? It, well, for me it was, it, uh, however, I got to preface it that I had to identify, um, one of the things that the SEAL teams taught me was always to move towards those things that you're afraid of, yeah. you know, move towards and don't let anything hold, so, hold you captive. Mm -hmm. And for me, all my life was school, being a student, math, science, physics, all these things. And they, these were like, like I've said before, dark looming clouds over my life. And I'm like, I hate that these things scare me so much. I hate it. And I, I was like, I just need to go. Yeah. I need to go towards it. And the yeah. way that I view life is this like highway with multiple avenues and, and those avenues are your emotional, your spiritual, your intellectual, your academic. These are, and I want to extend, I want to reach the ends of each of these before I die so that on my deathbed, I could yeah. be like, you know, yeah. you know, I, at least I wasn't afraid to go towards those things. Yeah. I, I wanted, I tried it. Maybe this one was really hard, but you know what? I'm going to still yeah. go through it, yeah. through with it. And I was fortunate enough to study hard enough at community college that I got accepted to a bunch of really great schools. And yeah, Columbia was one of them. Yeah. So uh, where did you go to school? Uh, what You were going to a community college what, out in San Diego? Where? Yes. I went to San Diego Mesa College. Okay. Probably, hands down, I would say 100% better school than Columbia University. No shit. Yeah. I, I think- Shout out to Mesa College. Yeah. Well, I think community <laughs> colleges in general are better. I think what they do is they, you know, people that have the ability to go to college right away are already at a certain level. I think community college, what they do is they, you know, generally elevate the people to a to a level in which they're capable of of going. I think there should be more community colleges. Um, there's professors that have an intimate connection with their students. They they care. They they are there for a reason. They can connect with these students. At these major universities, as great as they are, you have researchers that are teaching that have they don't care at all. They don't even like teaching. They shouldn't even be teaching in the first place. I had math professors that were uh, fellows of the Royal Society of Science 
in the same, you know, the chair, the same positions that Newton was on and Hawking was on. These these people that are ridiculous. They have theorems named after them, but had no business teaching. Yeah. However, at a community college, there's there's that connection where where you can actually stop and not fe- stop the instructor and yeah. not feel bad about saying, "Hey, I don't know how you got from here to there." Yeah. And whereas at a major university, there they would say stuff like, "Well, clearly that's obvious how yeah. I got there," and yeah. it just leaves you like angry it's, it sounds like there's almost a feeling of uh or or an element of kind of entitlement or arrogance or or you know like a you know uh yeah i mean like, like i guess arrogance would probably be the, the best word to describe it that exists with those people like they just they they feel like their shit doesn't stink and and you know you should feel privileged that i'm allowing you to sit in my class like is there an element of that i think it's also i think that exists and i think it's also because the teaching aspect is such a minute part of the part that they play in the university. They're yeah. researchers that are trying to discover new theorems and formulas, yeah. and, and they're just hassled by this. Oh, I have to teach like two classes. And so this was like a fucking collateral duty for them. Yeah, really. For for a lot of these, not it's not all of them. Yeah, it's just there were there were some that were yeah kind of a pain in the ass. Yeah, were there, were there any uh, professors that you had at Columbia that just like were mind bogglingly brilliant that that inspired? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I had I had a professor who was actually um, in uh, Professor Bayer. He was in a Beautiful Mind. That, no that movie. He was one of the consultants for it. Did the math for it, and he yeah. was actually an extra in it. And his ability to do math was just insane. It, yeah. He could go up to the board and he draws pictures. He doesn't do math using he he draws squares and shapes and these trees and he figures out formulas using these these just shapes, these random shapes and yeah. icons and. It's crazy, and it was just so fascinating that I actually developed a really good relationship with him, and I, I ended up getting an A in his class because you know I yeah. because his enthusiasm was super infectious, yeah. and I, I wanted to learn. He wasn't just so disconnected from the student; yeah. he wanted you to learn too. So he pulled you in and was yeah. animated guy. So is that that style of uh, of formulation and teaching that he did? Is there a, a name for that, or was that just completely unique to him and his class? Or uh, I, I thought it was unique to him. Maybe it exists yeah. with other professors. Like there's not a coined phrase that I don't think so. That, I mean, yeah. Not that I'm aware of. Yeah, that's some wild shit. It's not like fucking Common Core where you're like, what the fuck? Yeah, I know with my kids. I mean, some of the problems they bring home, they show me how to solve them. I'm just like. Either I'm that stupid, or you think I'm that stupid, yeah. or I mean, like I don't know. It, it's it's bewildering, you know, the 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 method which with which they come up with uh, with some of the solutions to some math problems. Uh, admittedly, I'm math is not my fucking strong suit either. Which I know you mentioned that kind of off the cuff. Like, did did you growing up? Did you not have an understanding, or just didn't give a fuck about math, or was it both? I mean, like, because to me, it, it's. I was fucking terrible at math. I still am. Uh, you know, I under I understand like from a business standpoint, basic accounting principles because I have to. But the thought of me at this point, like trying to to go to a place like Columbia and and, and get a degree in fucking math uh, from an Ivy League college is like I can't I can't really fathom it. Like, what, what was that? How how did that transformation take place? So uh, there's a there's a book that I read about once or twice a year. And it's not even a book. It's like a small essay. It's by Sam Harris. And the book is called Free Will. And I just, I have to, I reread it. It's like 65 pages, a small, tiny book. I'll have to send you a copy of yeah. it. Um, and it, it just explores the notion of human free will as a, is it a reality or is it an illusion? Do we have human free will? Um, and it's a, it's a concept that's in my mind all day, every day. I think, I think about it a lot. And this book came out, I don't know how many, seven years ago or, or however. And what it did was it allowed me to to understand better in what I think free will is an illusion. I don't think it's a real thing. Yeah, I, I remember uh, reading something about that as basically like 98% of your life is actually predetermined based on genetic and and the the initial environment that you're brought up in type of thing is is you're, you fall into patterns, right? Is that kind of the... Yeah, so, and, and there are... In that web of pattern of where you are today, there are, you know, there are prior causes or these tipping points that yeah. led you yeah. in certain directions. And for me, um, I remember having read this book. It allowed me to uh, to begin this process of attempting process of self discovery because I want to understand why I am the way I am, why I feel about certain things, people. I want to understand what led me to this moment. And um, 
math obviously was one of those dark looming clouds. And I wanted to understand why I was so scared of it. Why does it scare me? And I can trace that that's one of the about a handful of prior causes that I've been able to identify in the last seven years that I've been in this journey. I've only been able to identify a few of these things. And one of them is math. And one of them was my sister saying to me when I brought home math homework in middle school that, oh, none of us are good at math. None of us are in this family is, is any good at math. We don't know it. And that served as the prior cause which deviated me or set me on a course in my life where I allowed myself to believe I was bad at math. But having identified that now, years later, I was able to go back and prove to myself that that wasn't correct. And now I made it, I made it a, a, a point to say, okay, well, I understand this about free will. For me, I need to go back, erase that, that path that I took and create a new path from that moment. Yeah. And that took a lot of patience and it took a lot of practice, a lot yeah. that, which is why I had to cover my walls and whiteboards. Yeah. It took a lot to, cause I wanted to give up. I was frustrated because that little voice in my head was still there. That's like, yeah. you know, we're not good at math. We're not good at math. But the reality is I had allowed that. And oftentimes I think we allow ourselves to believe things that about ourselves. Like yeah. we're not good at math. The reality is you're, it, it's annoying. It takes a lot of practice and patience, but you can do it. You know, you, yeah. Well, so going back to the earlier part of our conversation, do you think um, that there's an element of of insecurity uh, about that, that that helped drive that? Oh, of course. Yeah. I think absolutely. That yeah. that's one of those. You can call each of those tipping points certain yeah. tipping yeah. points as insecurities. That's yeah. a good point. Yeah. Oh, that's fascinating. I love it. I, I yeah. I'm I'm vaguely familiar with Sam Harris. I know he's been on Rogan's podcast and. And I've, I've heard kind of that theory behind it. I'll have to look further into that for sure. That's fucking neat. Um, so the, the overall experience at Columbia, um, to, to kind of synopsize that, what was that like? I know you talked a little bit about it and that, you know, in terms of the safe, you know, lack of safe spaces and it's, uh, just like with, you know, a lot of the, um, stereotypes that exist with guys like you and I in, 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 in the public that, that aren't factually accurate or, or not quite what they seem uh can you just kind of tell me the i'm curious because i never went to to college college i you know i went to night school as an instructor and got my degree but never had that college experience what, what was that like being an, an older combat excuse me combat veteran i think one of the great things about it was there's a there was a two-way fascination in that these 18 19 year old brilliant kids would look at me with their mouths wide open in yeah. fascination that I had a life outside of school. <laughs> yeah. They would say this. They'd be yeah. like, you've, you've like, what's you've life been outside like? the wire. Yeah. What's yeah. life like? So they'd look at me like that. And I'd look at them with, you know, equal amount of fascination. Like you're a child genius, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So it, I don't, I, to me, I, when my experience at Columbia wasn't that like, I also wasn't like a, the salty veteran. I, yeah. I didn't play that role. I didn't see that very often yeah. with all the veterans. I think that's just a, a like yeah. a, a, a prototype that's hyped up that yeah. might not really exist. Yeah. All the veterans that I know, which Columbia has a lot, Columbia does a great job with veterans. In fact, um, they meld right in. You, you you mold right into the to the crop, and uh, you you conform. I mean, as much as you can conform as a salty old veteran. Yeah. Um, but there's a, a mutual learning process from everybody there. People want to know, and 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 I'm not like jumping under my desk at the yeah. sound of a dropping pencil <laughs> yeah. and screaming Charlie in the trees or anything. Yeah. Um, I had it, that experience was great. I didn't, yeah. I didn't experience that. Like what you see on the news. I, I think, I also think there's this, there's just like a wildfire. You see one kid that posts one picture of Tide Pods and all of a sudden that gets associated yeah. to every kid, every child. And yeah. this generation is so weak and you're yeah. like, please come on yeah. because this stuff has spread yeah, so yeah, quickly. Yeah. But um, yeah, the the experience there, besides some of these like terrible professors that I had, yeah. was was pretty good. Yeah. I mean, I got to live in New York City. That GI Bill is phenomenal. Um, there's also an extension of the GI Bill you can use called Voc Rehab, which um, if anybody has any questions about, it, they can send me a message on Instagram or whatever. Um, but I I encourage all the veterans to use that GI Bill. It's it's gold. I mean, you get paid New York City B A H to go to school at Columbia. Yeah. Where they pay for your education. Yeah. Your two hundred seventy thousand dollar degree. I ended up with about seventeen grand in debt, and yeah. that was it. You yeah. know, they paid for everything else. Yeah. Which is like. That's how it ought to be. Yeah. You know? But it's it's 
it's nice that you had that experience. I know for me, not to, I mean, I got nothing to bitch about, but because of the, the accelerated nature with which the program I was in was, it was capped. And so I ended up with about that same amount of debt. Um, but you know, again, like in the grand scheme of things, I mean, they didn't shell out 270 or, or anywhere near that, but, uh, it was still, still a good program. It's one of the things that I think, uh, uh, from a veterans affairs standpoint is, is done pretty well, you know, but, uh, that's, you know, for anybody out there listening, that's thinking about joining the military for that, that purpose, like you said, ask if you have any questions, ask him, but, uh, you know, he's a, a good, really prime example of, of, uh, you know, if you take advantage of some of the programs out there and are willing to serve your country, uh, on behalf of, of, uh, taking care of that, then, uh, then it's a hell of a good way to go and, and an incredible opportunity. But, um, just out of my pure, um, you know, filthy fascination, the, uh, like being a, I mean, how old were you? So you were in your early thirties when you showed up? Yeah. I mean, what was that like, like with fucking 19 year old girls, you know, like was, was there an element of like, you're the creepy old guy? Or, no, actually or, only because I have like a youthful look. Yeah. Uh, people, I mean, yeah. I mean, you look like you're fucking 25 now. But, <laughs> so people assumed that people yeah. assumed I was like a yeah. younger guy and they, yeah. they would freak out when they realized the only way they could actually identify that I was a veteran was my beard and, and yeah. tattoos, you know? Yeah. Um, but, uh, most people thought I was younger, much younger than, yeah. than I actually am. Yeah. Did, did uh, other than the just kind of the pure zoo-like fashion fascination of like we've never seen this unicorn guy before, you know, that, you know, whatever that's outside of school. But what was there an element of, uh, you know, where men and women, you know, guys and girls in in the college like wanted to to get to know you better because of that? Like, was there kind of almost a rock star? I mean, especially being a seal, like yeah, you know, it's not like you're an O three hundred infantry guy that you know not nothing nothing against those guys god god bless the fucking marines but but you know in terms of percentage like it, it's a bit of an anomaly was that an element that uh, that helped you out a lot so for the most part um students at columbia generally tend to keep to themselves because the course load is so intense um so obviously i didn't advertise that was that i was even a veteran when I would get to know people and when they would learn that I was a SEAL, there was always that, yeah, there was always that fascination. Yeah. Um, obviously, everyone wants to know. Everyone actually always wants to talk about Hell Week. That seems to be yeah. the thing that everyone yeah. wants to discuss. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I didn't, I didn't only, only on those occasions. And, in fact, I had maybe on three several, uh, separate occasions at Columbia, I had people recognize me from Instagram, from no social shit. media. So people <laughs> went to school there. Like, I know you knew who I was, yeah. which is, we, it's trip. always weird. Yeah. It's, it's no, weird. it is. It's a fucking trip, but social media and, and that whole existence is, is a fucking odd one for sure. I mean, it's its own universe almost, but, uh, was there anything, were there, were there any negative experiences with you having been a, a veteran, a SEAL, where, where it really kind of cut you in the, or kicked you in the balls or? Yeah, I had. So if you were to ask me a few years ago, or if we were to sit in here with a, a third person and they said, well, you know, this, this professor just hated me. I would kind of just nod along with it, but inside I'd be like, well, you're probably just a shitty student. You know, I don't yeah. think that really exists. Um, and I thought about that for years mm -hmm. until I had one specific professor who taught like an art class. It was like an art history class, masterpieces of Western civilization. Yeah, that, that'll take you somewhere. Yeah, and exactly. <laughs> and this this young lady, she was she might have been younger than me, um, just did not like me in the class. She she I don't know if she was just she knew I was a veteran. And I guess on the roster it, they can tell who's on like the GI Bill or whatever and they can, you know, detect who's a veteran. I was like super active in that class. I was, I was obviously I'm interested in everything. I love, I love the art. I love masterpieces. I love talking about this kind of stuff, dissecting, you know, differences in art. I was very active and, and, and played a huge role. And even other students in the class were like, man, she does not like you. And I, and I didn't understand why I, I, I participate. I wrote papers. I had like English majors and, and English, you know, uh, people with degrees in English helped me like structure my paper and, and I'd go to the museum and I'd do these comparison works and I'd write these great pieces. You paid them to do your and homework. She, and she would, oh no, I would, <laughs> I, would uh, I was pretty good about that, yeah, about yeah. doing my own work, but there were people like that. Yeah, no, I don't doubt it. Um, and, and she diced my stuff. I ended up with like a C in a, cl in that class. And that, I don't know how you get a C in, in yeah. uh, masterpieces of Western civilization. Yeah. It was like demoralizing. Yeah. And, and the only thing I could, I could, um, 
you know, discern from, from that class was maybe she just didn't like vets. I know the work I was producing wasn't garbage. Yeah. I had a, a, a actual, an actual interest in the material. I participated a lot in class. There was no reason for me to have this. And I, I just let it go uncontested because I honestly don't care. Yeah. Um, but that was the only negative. So today I would say that teacher didn't like me. I'd be that guy that yeah. I would say, you're probably just a shitty student. But the reality <laughs> yeah. is I get it now. So yeah. maybe I was wrong yeah. throughout this whole, throughout my history. Yeah. Well, I think just like with anything is that, you know, for every, every time that that's used as an excuse as to why you fucked up, it's probably in the single percentage of when it's actually, you know, the case. But uh, did you ever ask her just like, hey, what what the fuck? Or you just like, so I just, just didn't yeah, I just, yeah. it was, it was, I don't have the energy to yeah. care. I'm like, yeah. I got to see an art class. This has yeah. nothing to do with my major. Like, yeah. whatever. I'm not concerned with hyper concerned with GPA. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Uh, so speaking of your major, pure math, can you uh, kind of just explain what the fuck that means for those of us who yeah. are abacus uh, retarded? <laughs> the abacus. Yeah. I love <laughs> Abacusly things. challenged. Is that a word? It should be. Um, so pure math, the, the only different, uh, differentiating aspect of pure math and applied math is applied math is generally used more towards, uh, the applicable side in engineering and, and physics and stuff, which was my intended, um, my intended major. However, I missed a class, a fall seminar class, and I would have had to extend another year or at least another semester at school. So I ended up switching to pure and got a degree in that. And that deals more in number theory and cryptography, um, super challenging, but n maybe not as useful in application. Um, like there's like, I don't know if you know, like, um, the Fer Fermat's last theorem. Oh yeah. And, and, no, I've actually got the, the Cliff's <laughs> notes in the shitter. So it's like a 300 year old problem <laughs> that was just solved in like the nineties by oh, this okay. guy named Andrew Wiles. Yeah. And it's just this, I helped him with that. Yeah. yeah. So the, it, it's just these like really neat and interesting number theories you yeah. know that exist out in nature and in the reality is is it's fun yeah. it, it's super frustrating yeah but you can you can you can't be bored if you're messing around with numbers and, yeah. and ideas and concepts I can be. yeah, yeah. Uh, there's some people like <laughs> if you so i think a major problem is that exists in math is people don't learn the history of math and yeah. learn like the challenges and the duels that existed yeah. And, and if they learned what went into this, these discoveries, yeah. instead of just trying to understand that, if they learn the whole yeah. full spectrum, be like, yeah. wow. No, I, I agree. I mean, I, I, I like to joke because I'm a smart ass, but uh, <laughs> no, I mean, obviously math is, is wildly important, both uh, societally, militarily, culture wise, I mean, everything, you know, our, our, our human existence and experience has, has relied heavily on it. And I think you bring up a great point is that the, the background of it, and, th and that's true with anything is I think one of the biggest reasons why both math and science, uh, as, as Americans, as a society, our children struggle and, and are falling further and further behind is because of exactly that is, is a lack of, of background and, and, and context as it relates to why it's fucking important. Because if something's challenging and hard and, and there's no tangible reason that you, especially as a young person can wrap your mind around as to why the fuck you have to learn it, it's way harder to, you know, to, to give a shit, you know? And so I think, you know, from a big picture standpoint, um, our, our society could, could and should do a, a much better job for both math and science and, and explaining that it's a, it's a neat, uh, neat way to look at it. Um, was the, was the drive to, to do pure math and, and as it relates to physics, astrophysics, space program stuff that, that you're heading into now, um, was there a, a correlation there early on, or has it been kind of a, a transformation that's, that's happened gradually or what, what's that relationship like? So in the academic process, it was a gradual transformation. Uh, the intended major was astronomy, um, because of my love for the stars, because my friends convinced me I should probably go study this stuff. Uh, then I, I went to school and I met up with a, a group of other veterans and I wanted nothing to do with veterans. They were starting a veterans, a student veterans organization. And I was like, Oh, the last thing I want to do is hang out with other vets. I just want to be a student. Turns out this was the best decision. One of the best decisions I made was to hang out with these guys, vets from all different branches because they were just highly motivated guys. We got out of the core of us. We had guys go to like Yale university, you know, Columbia, MIT, there was guys that went to UCSD and just guys that were passionate about their, 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 you know, what they wanted to study. And so 
they knew I had an interest in astronomy, but they said I should go for something a little harder. That way I could apply to the, like, you know, NASA astronaut role later on, which wasn't an, I was something far fetched for me to work at NASA. Yeah. But I agreed. I said, I, I let them convince me that I, I should go something more difficult. So I, I started studying the astrophysics route, a lot of astronomy, and then unfortunately ran out of, didn't have enough GI bill and, uh, voc rehab to continue to fully finish out an astrophysics degree. So I ended up just fl uh, flipping it to a math degree since I had already accumulated a bunch of math classes. Um, and I knew I wanted to continue with math because I wanted, you know, to prove to myself that I wasn't just a bad, that I had only allowed myself to believe I was bad. Um, so then it became uh, a math degree and then, or applied math. And then it became a, a pure math degree just in time to dry up my GI bill. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, that's a, uh, it's a neat, a neat experience to hear that, uh, that you had that positive impact from, from fellow veterans, because I think, you know, while there's an element of, of it's important to get outside your comfort zone and, and interact with people that you have almost nothing in common with, I think it's equally important to surround yourself by people that have similar experiences and mentalities to, uh, you know, kind of that tribe mentality. I don't know if you've read that. Ian Junger. Junger. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, but, um, you know, there's an element of that that I, I think plays a huge role in, in our personal development also. I, and again, not to, here I go with the balance routine again, but, uh, you know, it's the balance of both. I think that's important. Um, I know that, uh, Carl Sagan and, and Neil deGrasse Tyson are both pretty big uh, influences. Can you talk about, uh, I would call Carl maybe the uh, godfather of greenhouse gas, maybe? Yeah. Um, to me, it, it's it's pretty neat to, uh, like from a, from both, a, I guess you could say, a space communicator standpoint. I mean, he was, correct me if I'm wrong, the first guy to, you know, kind of uh, involve us as a, as a, as a race. Uh, in, in targeting that and trying to communicate uh, extraterrestrially, uh, but then also the greenhouse gas thing with uh, with the Venus surface mm -hmm. temperature, right? Can you talk talk about him and Neil deGrasse Tyson in terms of their influences and, and roles they've played in uh, in your life? Yeah, I think I would find I would have a difficult time trying to find anyone else who has influenced my life more than Carl Sagan. Yeah. I think I think I'm still sad that he passed away. You know, yeah. and he passed away what twenty something years ago. Yeah, um, the guy was just ahead of his time. And, and he, he saw, I love the way he saw the world and he introduced in his method of, of science, scientific communication, he was able to like capture a, a an audience that wouldn't otherwise search or, or seek this kind of, uh, this kind of literacy in science. And he, it did happen for me. You know, I, I stumbled upon a lot of Carl Sagan on YouTube. I think, first of all, I think YouTube changed the world. Oh, fuck yeah. It you know, it, it, it yeah. absolutely did for me. It, and porn tube. Oh, of course. <laughs> <laughs> it's um, a lot of tubes changing the world. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, his his grasp, I guess, I was just envy envious of his perspective. He yeah. had a perspective that was phenomenal, and yeah. and it helped elevate mine. And and I think, in terms of astronomy, when you study, you know, objects in scopes and scales and vastness, such as the universe, the cosmos, time itself. I think you get a better understanding of our cosmic circumstance. I think, I think when you see us as humans from a perspective of an dispassionate extraterrestrial, for example, you see that we are entirely more alike than we are different. And those, those reasons to be more alike are cause for celebration. I think, mm -hmm. you know, unfortunately we have these extremists who allow, you know, unfalsifiable ideologies to, to take hold and, and they commit atrocities, but the reality is we look identical if something came from somewhere else and, and, and viewed us. And I started slowly adopting, you know, the more I read, the more I, I of Carl Sagan, the more I listened to Carl Sagan, I, I watched his shows. I downloaded every one of his speeches on YouTube and put them on an iPod. And I would actually work out and, and, and listen to Carl Sagan. And yeah. I just wanted to understand. And slowly I started developing a, 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 a picture which allowed for, you know, me to become a more peaceful person. Uh, in fact, a happier person. Yeah. Um, and Neil deGrasse Tyson had the same effect. In fact, I met Neil deGrasse Tyson. I, I have his phone number in my, in we my should. phone. Yeah. We're going to, we're going to post that on, uh, we should just straight <laughs> call up, him, call him, him up right now. Yeah. Um, I met him a few years ago. I met him. I, I, he was speaking at USC and I was in San Diego. It was probably like 2012 or 2013. 
and I, I raced up the worst condition or the worst circumstance turned into the best in that I had no ticket. I had nothing. I just brought a book, a copy of his book and a pen for him to sign it. And I happened to run into him on campus like five hours before his scheduled speech. And I told him I didn't have a ticket. I told him who I was and everything. And, and he like was, gave me his phone number. He was like, we're going to get you on the guest list. Don't worry. Oh, Everything's sure. going to be fine. I hung out with him for about a half an hour. And then he had me wait for him. I waited for him. He came back about 45 minutes later. We, we tried breaking into the, to the hall where he was giving a speech. <laughs> no shit. We ended up breaking into one of the Dean's office where the secretary was there <laughs> just watching us. And she's, she like started scolding us. Yeah. And I was like, do you realize who this guy is? Like yeah. this is NDT. Yeah. You can't talk to him like that. And so he ends up like, uh, text, uh, we end up parting ways. He goes and gets ready. He texts me like, Hey, just, just show up before there's any line come claim your, your badge. You have an all access badge. So I was able to, I was able to get a badge and go into the auditorium front and center with, I think it was his brother, his brother's wife, his daughter and niece. There was just like five of us or six of us seated there. The whole thing is empty as he's setting up his equipment. We're just like, you know, shooting the shit back and forth with yeah. NDT. Damn, that's awesome. Yeah, super cool. And then at the end of the night, I you know, he signed my book and everything. At the end of the night, um, it was like midnight and I leave. Me and my friend who I went with, we leave and we we are like, screw it. We're just going to send him a text message. Yeah. It's like 1 a.m. or something. Like, hey, Dr. T, like, thanks for everything. That was awesome. Immediately response. Like, it's just like, hey, that was awesome for you to come. Like, great, great to have you. Let yeah. me know, you know, what I can do. Damn, that's wild. Yeah, super cool guy. Yeah, iPhone or Android? iPhone with him, you know I I, mm-hmm. I don't remember. Yeah, I'd be curious to know what a, what a mind like that. Same I think with, it's iPhone. If I remember correctly, the screenshot I have of the conversation yeah. is blue yeah. bubble on yeah. his part yeah. or uh, gray on his part. Would Carl Sagan be an iPhone user? I think so. Yeah, probably. That wealth of knowledge yeah. in your hand at yeah. any moment, I think no, he I would be a proponent. Yeah, I think he'd be blown away. But uh, that's some neat shit. One of the things that um, I guess surprises me about. Uh, about Neil is is kind of the the anti philosophy um, viewpoint that he takes, uh, and I, I don't necessarily agree or disagree. I just find it uh, surprising, I guess, that you know somebody with his uh, level of both knowledge and uh, and intellect genetically, um, you know, at least in you know from my perspective, seems to view philosophy as as a negative or, or as kind of anti that way, do you get a, do you get that same representation from him and B um, what, where do you suppose that comes from or, or what's your take on it? I think he sides very much with Stephen Hawking. When Stephen Hawking said philosophy is dead um, <clears throat> only because I, I don't think it's dead. I think on a personal level, philosophy is important. I think it allows us to explore avenues about ourselves that we wouldn't otherwise understand without philosophy I think kind of as a whole big picture, maybe it, it is dead because we we can dwell on these 2,500 year old stories like Plato's cave, the allegory of the cave and suss out meanings or or we can we can, you know, gather up what we as humans experience subjectively and th- define an objective reality. And that's the way I think they see how we move forward as a species. Yeah, because we have our subject, you know, at the end of the day everything is subjective because it's humans that are experiencing it. So despite what we call flaw or fact, it's still us that names it. So there's still an element of subjectivity to it. Yeah. I I think uh, there's an element of of technology that both demystifies and almost kind of ruins philosophy and, and religion for that matter, you know, is that, is that historically when you look at when philosophy and religion has been at its height, it's, you know, it's, uh, counterbalanced technology to a certain extent and that you know it, it's a little bit of, of again a kind of looking behind the curtain is that with with the information that we have as you're i mean just thinking about having a fucking iphone in your hand like the amount of fucking knowledge that is literally at your fingertips is, is astounding you know and and if you and if you contrast that to the human experience up until about five years ago or let's say 20 years ago, you know, the, the advent of the internet, essentially in terms of it being able to actually be used the way that we use it now. Like it's, I mean, the world is, is so vastly different, you know, that, that I think there's an element of, of almost irrelevancy with both of those aspects. Um, I mean, that's kind of my take on it, but it is, do you get the impression that, uh, that that's kind of where he's coming from on it or? Yes, I think so. And I agree. I, I will say I agree with him. Yeah. I think, he has mentioned something like this before where he says, 
out of respect for the human intellect and and our technology and our ability to understand, we should kill aspects of religion or or philosophy that no longer hold up to the rigorous um, requirement of of evidence or proof or yeah. detail that that we are able to achieve now with the technology this intersection of technology and science some aspects of ancient philosophy should die you know we we can't hang on to these things forever we have to move forward yeah. in the best way we know how but but strangely he is an advocate for both santa claus and the easter bunny yeah, yeah. Stra- who'd have thought still tells his kids that santa's coming down the thing. there's well there's there's <laughs> That that kind of stuff can exist without the yeah. mystical. I know, you know it. No, I know it. Um, all right, so you you graduate Columbia. Um, lots of good experiences there. You get your degree in pure math. Now walk us through once you graduate. Obviously, just happened here uh, earlier this year. I, I'm, I'm fascinated by your path in terms of you know moving down here to Texas and and starting to get involved with uh, the space program at NASA if you can uh, talk to us about that. Sure. So long-term goal is I would like to apply to the astronaut program. Perhaps not the next iteration which may be in 3 years if I can squeeze out a graduate degree in this time I will, but maybe possibly the one after it which will be maybe in 5 or 6 years. So my intended goal was to or is to study an aerospace engineering or mechanical engineering graduate program um, and be ready for the next, you know, whenever possible. However, I came down to, I moved down to Texas on a whim, essentially, because I I want to experience it all before I die. I lived in California, lived in New Jersey, lived in New York City. I never lived in in Texas, you know. I love guns, love shooting guns. New Jersey, New York, and Tech and great, California great are the three have. worst places <laughs> yeah. to have or carry or anything to do with weapons. Yeah. So I love the freedom here that I get to carry, conceal. Um, and so I kind of wanted to experience it. I heard Austin is a great place. It, it's kind of got a little bit of everything. And it's a hub for team guys. There's like yeah. team guys everywhere in Austin. So moved down here. Went and visited uh, Chris Cassidy, head former head astronaut at NASA, old SEAL Team 3 guy. Yeah, uh, He let me crash at his place for a few days. He took me on the grand tour behind the scenes of all of the Johnson Space Center and took me to the uh, neutral buoyancy lab. I told him my plan was to apply eventually and what I wanted to go to school for. And he, you know, he, he kind of gave me some guide, some pointers on, on how to best prepare my application and make myself the most attractive candidate. Yeah. And I realized I could just get a job at NASA while, while you know, pursuing this graduate program. University of Houston has a great aerospace engineering program, so I decided to, on a you know, on kind of on another whim, apply to this position at at the Neutral Buoyancy Laboratory, which is, I mean, we have we're divers, so we're we're capable of doing it. And in this job, my job is essentially to become the subject matter expert on the spacesuit and the modules of the International Space Station, because in this gigantic 6.2 million gallon pool of clear water that's nice and warm there's an entire mock-up of the international space station and so what we use that is to best mock gravity zero gravity conditions um and and help the astronauts become familiar with both their suits and the external modules of the international space station so we create conditions in the on the outside that they're going to face up there in reality uh, so right now, I actually st- I got hired for that position. I start in about two weeks on the seventeenth, yeah. actually in exactly two weeks, yeah. and uh, I'll be doing that during the week. And it's a great it's a great program for me because they they're very uh, they're very um, um, they're very okay with me doing a, a graduate degree, and they're okay with me bringing yeah. the stuff to to work and study there. And yeah. and and they're obviously I have the best engineers in the world to you know bounce it off to of, bounce it yeah. off to learn pay them from, to do your homework. Yeah, <laughs> oh, obviously. Yeah. Um, Two things. One, like, and in, in, well, it can't hurt. Obviously, like, if you're, uh, you know, a diver and and uh, you know, work, working there uh, in preparation to become an astronaut, like, that's only got to reflect positively on you. And, and you know, what what you mentioned about bouncing stuff off of guys and, and learning from. But I'm curious, like, what what are the uh, boxes that have to be checked to become a fucking astronaut or apply to it? Like, what is what yeah. is that? So, in order to become an astronaut, the the requirements are are little. I guess it's it's a little it's not right correct in in what they say on the website it says 
historically it was you needed a STEM degree, a, a bachelor's degree and a STEM field, any kind of science, technology, engineering, or math. And then you needed at least three years of relevant work in your field in order to uh, apply. However, that's not the case anymore. You need a graduate degree. They don't say that you do, but that is a requirement. Mm -hmm. um, you need a graduate degree. There's a lot of people that apply to this program now. Yeah. And the, one of the major things that knocks people off is they don't have a graduate degree. They're not a U.S. citizen or, or you know, there's a, various other reasons why they get knocked off. But, you know, I, I talked to, I was in sort of a group of people in New York City who all wanted to be astronauts. They're astronaut candidates, future hopefuls. And what was interesting is <clears throat> they were all afraid of me. These were all <laughs> these were all people that were no shit getting MD PhDs. They were in these PhD programs. Brilliant people. And I was this like you know, bearded, tattooed, like yeah. guy who's still getting a bachelor's degree. Yeah. And they were all they would all fear comp competing against me. Yeah. And I learned that, you know, what they said was any kind of any nerd can get a PhD, but not every nerd is willing to be like submerged, isolated, you know, let your hand, your, give your, put your life in the hands of others, confined spaces. Not everyone is willing to do all those things. They think they can, yeah. but they can't. And the, the beauty of, of being a SEAL is- You've proven that. Yeah, that, that yeah. is out of the question. That's already done. Yeah. There's, you're a risk taker, you're a skydiver, you do all yeah. these things. Yeah. And so they, I think they were, they were right. I, I later learned that they were right in learning that they should be afraid yeah. because- um, because you'll Nancy Kerrigan their ass if not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't want to have to compete against yeah. them anyway. So I spiked their drinks. Yeah. Well, I'm, and the other thing too is like, you know, who who's a better candidate for for Space Force at this point, right? Seriously. <laughs> yeah. Door gunner, yeah. space shuttle. Well, that's fucking great. Um so the in terms of the the job that you'll be doing now, talking about, you know, going back to the uh, the scuba diving portion and the you said it's a six point Two million gallon, gallon pool. pool. Yep. Um, like, what what all does that consist of in terms of like what what I mean, if you even know or can tell me, like, what's a typical day of of that? So I don't start. I start on the seventeenth, but I have like a probationary nine months where I have to get <clears throat> all the safety diver certifications checked off, go through review board. Uh, but then I begin as like a utility diver, safety diver, you know. And my my job is really to help the astronauts. Is is just to help them prepare. And although I might not be diving every day, my my job would be, I guess, on the off days to learn is, yeah. is to learn and study that space. Because we'll, we'll, as divers, we actually wear the suit. Also, we have to become familiar with with manipulating that space suit, which is going to be completely awesome. I, I can't yeah. wait to have the opportunity to wear that thing. Yeah. Um, can you piss in the spacesuit? I'm sure you can. You just yeah. wear diapers. Yeah. There's yeah. little fucking depends in there. I mean, are you going to piss in the space pool? I'm wearing some right now. <laughs> <laughs> you heard it first on mic drop. <laughs> that's fucking great but um <laughs> excuse me if i pause for a little while it's yeah. because i'm uh, why are your eyes rolling back <laughs> in your head yeah. but uh yeah so my that would be my job would be yeah. to become the subject matter expert. obviously i would have to take care of the pool also I, I don't know that i i'm in charge of cleaning the pool or anything yeah. but uh you know the pool is the facility itself is on television 24 hours a day all around the world people are interested in yeah. astronaut stuff so obviously I have no problem taking pride in my work area. They they yeah. made sure to mention like you know you see anything amiss, be yeah. sure to correct it. Yeah. So your job is to both take pride in the area and you know help the astronauts and and yeah. learn learn yeah. as much as you can. Yeah, that's that's a, a fascinating uh, program and and element to to that program is the pool. I know it plays an integral part in in training and it's a, it's a huge fucking component to it. So that, that's neat. I'm uh, curious to hear how, how it goes as you, as you get further into it. Um, one thing I'm just curious of, I know, I mean, do you, or, or can you tell me, you know, about how many like certified or, or titled quote unquote astronauts there are at NASA right now? Yeah. There's about 50 active at any time. <clears throat> and there's a, this is like a point of contention for a lot of people because there's, there are astronauts that stay active well into what should be retirement. Yeah. And, and some astronauts are, are, you know, like Chris Cassidy, he, he's very aware that he doesn't want to stick around that long because it, it kind of eats up a seat for yeah. other potential astronauts. Yeah. Uh, but there are astronauts that should retire. So it is a, like a billeted thing. Like there's only it so is, many. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. there, and we don't have a space shuttle program anymore. Uh, I assume when we have, other uh 
other methods of travel, like the boat, the SpaceX or Boeing or, or Virgin, when we have these other platforms, the NASA Space Launch System, the SLS, once we have the capability to launch a platform from the United States again, I, I think I don't see any reason why they wouldn't up the astronaut classes per year again. Yeah. Um, because now we have more methods to get up instead of just re- renting seats from the Russians. Yeah. This may sound like a dumb question. I just, I don't know any better is that, excuse me, do are, are all the astronauts that we currently have that are active, have all of them been to space? Mm-hmm. Like, are there, I think there's still, there's still a handful waiting to go up for the first time. Yeah. Yeah. Only, yeah. only cause there's, there's a lot of sitting around. Yeah. We're only going to the international space station right now, but when yeah. we open up, you know, other, other, you know, possibly the moon, Mars, asteroids yeah. back to low earth orbit. Yeah. Um, is, is there an, in terms of going to space, like, you know, do you have a kind of a lifelong goal or, or, uh, like an ideal, like this is my bucket list. Like I would like to do X in terms of the space program, in terms of going to space. Is there anything, any, any element to that? That's kind of what you're shooting for. This is going to sound like philosophical, but my primary goal, obviously, and uh, to help hu- move humanity forward. But my personal primary goal is to look back at earth. Yeah. I want to see Earth yeah. without borders. I want to see Earth what it looks like. I want to see it as an artist would see yeah. something because I, I feel that's life changing. That yeah. that would have to change your perspective. Yeah. And I want to know what that's like. Yeah. The, uh, the you know, there's an element of being able to clear up whether or not it's flat. I think that would be helpful too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that shit boggles my mind. I had to throw that in there. But yeah. um, one of the things that, um, in, you know, into, in I guess dovetail on your point about you know changing perspective. Something as simple as some of the movies that I've seen, uh, The Martian and Interstellar, being two of the more recent ones. That I don't know if you've seen Interstellar or not, but like to me, I, I fucking love that movie. Yeah. Like, I mean, I know there's a bunch of it that I mean, you could argue. I mean, it's all far fetched, but it seems like way out outside the scope of of what could be potentially realistic. But that that time space thing yeah. of you know when they're only gone for a matter of minutes to them and they come back oh, and the time do, dilation yeah like yeah. Oh, like that movie that movie changed my perspective a little bit like it's something i still think about i mean not every night when i fall asleep or when i'm jerking off but uh <laughs> you know but there there's an element of that 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 made me just think different and and it's just a fucking movie so i like i can't even imagine actually going and and staring at earth you know like to cuz if you're in the space station like you're looking at i saw like a a picture or a meme or something or whatever like a, a an image from space and you know the person that took that you know was was staring at everybody that's ever lived on earth while oh, yeah. it was the one person that, that was like that's, oh you're that's, talking about uh, michael collins is the only person not pictured yeah it's the whole globe and then it's he was the only one in the, it's uh, uh buzz aldrin and neil armstrong in the in the module heading either yeah. back up or down to the yeah. lunar surface. Yeah. I mean, like thinking about that, it's yeah. like, fuck, man. I mean, it just messes with your head a little bit. I mean, that's the one thing about space that, that has always fascinated me, you know, as, as a kid and even as an adult is just the, the, uh, the infiniteness, if that's a word of, yeah. of it. Um, and, and just how it doesn't even fucking make sense, yeah. you know? Um, and, and to me that like that shit is fascinating. And I think it's, it's really fucking cool, uh, you know what you've what you've done already, what you continue to do, uh, and and where you're going, man. I, I'm fucking proud of you, and I I, uh, I love love everything about what you're doing. So uh, keep up the fucking good work. I appreciate um, it. Yeah, um, wh- I guess just real quick, what what is your take on on those movies, uh, generally speaking? I think Interstellar blew my mind when they they were able to show time as a spatial dimension, something that I'd never considered when he's like floating back and forth behind the bookcase, Mm -hmm. he's floating in a, in time as a spatial dimension. I I don't even know how they would go about starting that process, but there are physicists who won, um, Nobel prize like Kip Thorne who worked on the physics behind that movie. Um, I thought, I thought the, the physics or the science behind it was awesome. It's, it's crazy to think time dilation, but it's a reality. In fact, it's one of those things that got me interested in this path. When I when we spoke earlier, and I said, um, "Flight of the Navigator," doesn't yeah. he comes back and he's like still the same age? And I'm pretty sure everybody's like about ten years older. Yeah, um, that didn't make sense in my head. Yeah, as a little kid, I would get under the covers and pretend I was in a <laughs> spaceship and hit a bunch of yeah. buttons, and then come out and act like a, like the world was ten yeah. years older. And yeah. it boggled my mind. I was like, I need to understand this. Yeah. And it's actually a reality, you know, yeah. high mass objects, you know, if you 
orbit any high mass object, the reality is your time will slow. Yeah. And and it just lends credence to Einstein and yeah. <clears throat> his theories of time space as a fabric yeah. of the universe. And and it, it's insane. Yeah. It does keep you up because yeah. then you're like what the fuck? Yeah, what is this? What's yeah. going on? But yeah. I, I, what I love about that whole, not just those movies and about space and about astronomy and the cosmos, is that all throughout history, very few things like space has had the ability to challenge our conventional wisdom. It, everything we understand about space just turns us around. You think yeah. pl- Earth is the center of the universe, the geocentric model that the church held on to for so long. And then the reality is we learn about orbits and we learn how to describe and these things shatter our we know yeah. what we would consider these like um the you know, common sense yeah but you applying reason you realize it's yeah. crazy and that 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 applies down to earth uh, to the individual then yeah. you hear an argument from somebody and you're like well am i actually getting all the parts how let me try to see it from this perspective and then this one and it translates i think for me real well into yeah. all kinds of things yeah well it, it's neat you bring that up i mean it, it, like if you think about it from uh the human perspective is that yeah like a lot of the things that that we know to be true only actually apply right fucking here and now you know like physics properties and and physical properties and things that when you when you uh, exit stage left of fucking mother earth like now the game's changed and it's totally fucking different and it's and it's so unknown that it's there's an element of it being scary and fascinating and and uh, groundbreaking and just all of it kind of wrapped into one that's uh, it's pretty fucking cool but uh yeah, there's a there's a quote by Galileo <clears throat> that he wrote about Copernicus, and it goes something like, "Nor can I ever fully admire Copernicus and his followers. They have, through sheer force of intellect, done such violence to their own senses as to prefer what reason told them over what sensible experience plainly showed them." So what we're talking about is the sensible experience that we have. We people think the moon landing is fake based on properties of understanding that we only have here. Yeah. You can't fault them for applying this kind of sensible experience it's a sensible experience you understand how shadows are cast on earth yeah. we understand physics on earth we understand how dust moves how the how the flag waves you know we understand these things the problem is we have a tendency to then ascribe that to other heavenly bodies celestial yeah. bodies and when we realize hey we only know what it's like with an atmosphere so the shadows on the moon there's various light sources that are creating the moon regolith the the, the dust that's on it floats differently because gravity is different. Yeah. The flag is made of aluminum. It's not real flag. And there's like, you know, different things affecting it, the radiation. And so we, we have this tendency to apply what we think we know to everything, but we don't have the full picture. So when yeah. Galileo said they, they used reason to destroy what sensible experience plainly showed them yeah. is, is what astronomy I think does for me. It's a, it's yeah. an ability to like try to dig more and, and, and get rid of, which is why I love the scientific method. It's, yeah. it's, uh, it's attempting to take the most subjective parts of us, of our understanding, and isolate those and try to approach something objectively, yeah. as objectively as yeah. we can. So there, there's an, because I'm a knuckle-dragging fucking dog trainer for a living is that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tie this as we wrap up back into dog training <laughs> is that like that's the single biggest problem uh, where people fall flat um, on their face in terms of training their dog is, is that exact mentality just in the context of, you know, all the things that you know to be um, logical and, and reason-based and, and things of that nature are from the human experience, not from the canine experience. And that's why so so many yeah, people have have so many problems with their dogs is because two, two main components, not to get too far off in the weeds, but it's mic drop, fuck you and choke yourself, <laughs> is that, uh, you know, you're... you're the, the fact that a, a dog's mind works like a calculator and it's something I say all the time is that they don't think in a language like just trying to understand that that your dog doesn't think in a language it makes associations with everything so you can appreciate that yeah. as being the, the math guy you are is that your dog is walking around with a fucking abacus bouncing around in his mind is that a plus b equals c for every fucking thing you know so just understanding that number one is that uh, and then number two is that they, they don't use logic and reason to figure things out you know everything is contextual and um, and everything is is very operant in, in that uh, regard from a psychology standpoint of, of the quadrants of positive and negative, either, uh, you know, withholding, adding or withholding uh, both po- um, reinforcement and punishment. And so um, essentially, I mean, you guys are like cosmic dog trainers is the way I look at it. <laughs> but that's, yeah. you, you bring up a great point because if you take a ball 
and you fake throw it yeah. and the dog turns around and you hold it behind your head, it has no reasoning ability. It starts yeah. to freak out. Yeah. It's like it's understanding of physics, the yeah. laws of the universe yeah. means there should be a ball somewhere over yeah. there. Yeah. So it freaks out. Humans are exactly the same way. Yeah. When we are incapable, when we've reached the extent of our understanding on any subject, we tend to ascribe, but we have this tendency to ascribe a supernatural yeah. thing to it that yeah. that will last only until that actual thing is explained. And then, yeah. you know, we bring it back a little bit. Yeah. But it's yeah. funny. Yeah. We are the same, dogs yeah. and humans. No, I know. There's a, there's a ton of parallels in uh, in learning psychology and stuff. It's just kind of the, the medium in, in, in which they're applied uh, can differ pretty greatly. But uh, once you do get on the program and uh, they kick off Space Force K-9, you just give me a call. and We'll do. We'll, we'll hook it up with the, with the, the dog space suit. But um, anyway. That'd be cool, actually. Yeah, be fucking great shit. Um, the, the last thing I want to ask is, again, it's something I, I like to ask most guests um, before we wrap up here is just uh, name, name something, uh, and it can be anything, that, uh, that you're grateful for. Um, let's see. So much. It's ridiculous. Um, I, I, have no, I have no problem admitting that I can be very sappy sometimes mm-hmm. and, and emotional when I'm by myself, like when I was driving up here from Austin, it was a few hours and I managed to catch sunset and just witnessing another sun, a sunrise, sorry, yeah. another sunrise. It, it, it just, it captivates me that I get to experience this, you know, Richard Dawkins talks about how there's in the, in genetics, there have been, a, there was a trillion possible people that could be here in our place. And it's us that won this cosmic lottery. So we get to experience this. Yeah. And, and it's, I think it's, beautiful you know yeah. i think there's obviously some bad to it but at the end of the day we still get to be here we you know we get to experience especially you and i and everyone most probably most people listening here the american experience in one of the best countries or the best countries and yeah. in the best planet that yeah. we know of so far yeah um i'm i'm grateful for it all i i have hard i mean i can say my brother my mother her work ethic i'm grateful for for the ability to be interesting enough to be called upon to sit on a podcast where mm-hmm. there's been, you know, monumental people on this before. There's just like so much to be grateful for. I, well, I can't pin it down. Yeah. Well, like I said, I, you know, to me, you're, you're right there with them. And uh, I have no doubt. I, I know that all the listeners will feel the same way. Uh, last question. Cause I forgot to ask, do you think that there is a life outside planet earth? I, yes, I yeah. think so. I think I side with Neil deGrasse Tyson when he said, um, it would be inexcusably egocentric to suggest we are alone in the universe. Yeah. I think it, it's just the universe is too big. Yeah. You know, the the elements, it's too vast. There's yeah. high mass stars blowing up every second across the universe, which are enriched with the, with the elements that, you know, allow for the thriving of life. Yeah. If we take, you know, our, our solar system as a standard, one, form of life in one Goldilocks zone per eight planets circling one star. And let's say that's in those conditions, we call that one in a billion. That would still mean intelligent life would be billion, maybe a billion times yeah. uh, re- repeated out there. So it's crazy yeah. mathematically. Yeah. Um, like almost how can there not be? Yeah. Yeah. So that the, the follow on question of that, and, and then I promise we'll wrap it up. I, I could, <laughs> honestly, I could ask you fucking dork questions all day. Cause I, I'm, this is my uh, this is my stuff. Yeah, I love this. It is uh you know from a just as a kid I always remember thinking like space has to end somewhere, right? But how can it because there's got to be something on the other side. Like like how how do you rationalize that? Like the the expansion of space and uh you know it, its existence across the board like I know it's impossible for anybody to answer you know factually or unequivocally, but what like what is your your thought process with that? I think, I mean, one of my very favorite subjects in cosmology and astrophysics is universal expansion. It's dark, dark energy. I think if you think about us as like a fabric, if if I take a half, a partially inflated balloon and started drawing, you know, many uh, galaxies on it, and then we blew it from the inside, that's how we're expanding. I think it's just the space between the galaxies, that fabric, that Einstein dis, you know, discovered, um, is what's expanding. Yeah. I, I have a hard time thinking about the edge edges of the universe because the only thing that to my knowledge travels faster than the speed of light is the expansion of the universe. So it's not like we can 
ever get there. We can't quite touch it. Yeah. Um, the universe was expanding for 382,000 years before the first inkling of light occurred, before friction created the first inkling of light. So it got a, a major head start. Yeah. I don't think, I don't, I, I don't know. Yeah. So what I'm not going to do is attempt to ascribe, you know, that boundary, yeah. something that makes me feel comfortable where some people would do. I'm okay with that kind of like, I don't require the cognitive closure that mo- many people might, yeah. you know, people like there may be two different types of people. One that yeah, I that, need an answer. Yeah. Yeah. yeah they, well, what they require is like a safety net yeah. and, and they get scared and, and they'd fail to realize that it's not like NDT says, it's not just we're here and the universe is out there. It's we're the same thing. Yeah. We are the universe looking back at itself. We yeah. are the product of the explosion of high mass stars, which have like the enriched yeah. different elements that came together over 4.54 billion years to create earth and, and, or to, yeah, to create earth. And then to, to finally somehow produce through trial and error, this thinking, this amoeba that then built upon, or uh, this protein that then built upon itself and create, yeah. kept experiencing and then maybe dying in different extinction periods. And then finally, you know, we're our, we are where we are, yeah. but we also don't have anything to gauge ourselves against. We yeah. think we're absolutely brilliant, but yeah. yeah, maybe we're a bunch of fucking drooling idiots. We're apes. Yeah. Uh, I think we should uh, take a break, trip some acid, come back and finish this conversation. Oh, you haven't started tripping yeah. yet? No, I mean, I, <laughs> I just assumed you hadn't, you know, with the oh. drug tests and all with the yeah. fucking acid. No. Uh, it, it's fascinating shit. Like I said, I, uh, I love what you're doing. I think it's fucking awesome. Um, um, uh, again, I'm, I'm proud of the, of the job that you've done. You continue to do and will do. And I think, um, what makes me the most proud is, is, uh, your ability to represent the community from which we came from. So, so positively and intelligently in the, in the field that you're in. Cause there's very, very few, I mean, you're the, the fourth basically, right. Of, of all seals who have even started to get involved in that program. So hats off to you, brother. Awesome. Fucking love what you're doing. I appreciate um, it. I appreciate you making time out of, out of your schedule to come up here and uh, shoot the shit. Um, anything you want to add uh, shout outs to anybody or, or uh, say anything before we uh, sign off? No, I just want to uh, uh, tell you how much I appreciate the invite. It was a drive, yeah. but it was worth the drive. Uh, it was a good conversation. And anytime you want to, Come down to the neutral buoyancy lab. We'll give oh, you a tour. I will. I'm going to piss in that pool. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you, we might have to like yeah. sink the entire yeah. pool, uh, yeah. drain the entire pool. Yeah. That'd be a shitty day. If I can put a baby Ruth at the but, bottom of the Yeah. Pool. Thanks for yeah. having me. This is awesome. <laughs> no, it's, uh, it's a pleasure having you. Uh, thank you for coming and uh, look forward to, to following your journey. But uh, for uh, all the listeners out there, there's one, one kind of recurring theme that I think is important uh, that I want to pass on. Uh, that I learned uh, about Mario today and and what I uh, think is is a very poignant lesson that that I've drawn from our our conversation, which is um, t- is two things basically is is number one is that you know making the best of uh, of whatever situation you find yourself in and and taking advantage of and and being driven. Uh, you know, to to achieve whatever it is that you want to achieve, despite your circumstances. Uh, there's people with better circumstances. There's people with worse circumstances. Uh, but the fact is, is that what you make of of your circumstances is what separates guys like you and and everybody else I've had on this podcast uh, from from people that haven't achieved their goals. Number two is that, uh, and this is the most most important one that I I talk to my kids about. I, I talk to everybody about, and I love the fact that you brought it up. And it's something again I use a lot and dog training is that uh, if something fucking scares you, do it until it doesn't. Um, you know, and, and there's there's no more valuable life lesson, I think, in terms of maximizing your your life experience and number two, overcoming your bullshit because you're not going to overcome your bullshit unless you do exactly that. So I appreciate you bringing that up and I, I fucking love it. Um, for all the listeners out there, uh, as always, I appreciate the hell out of you guys and uh, we would not give, we would not have the ability to, to continue to uh, to put these episodes out if it wasn't for your uh, unwavering and overwhelming support. Love you guys. Appreciate it. Um, as always, choke yourself. And uh, in keeping in tradition with the Mic Drop podcast, uh, I just want to say that uh, you guys are are the best ever. Love you. Uh, as as uh, as we wrap this up, this is Mic Drop. Mic Drop.